Okay, and we are live. Welcome to episode 24 of the Clutch Kick. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, EG, and below me again is Greg. Uh, and today's special guest is Shane Beresford from Sydney. Yay! Um, <laughs> just saw your kid just run past behind me. <laughs> She'll okay. do that a lot tonight. Yeah, nice. No, that's all right. That's fine. Um... Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Shane, as well as his involvement with drifting. Um, he's also uh, helped with, how, how would you say, design and get a, a track created from that design, I think. Yep, um, yep, and, yeah. And so we go through and have a chat about that sort of thing. Well, anything really that you really want to have a chat about, as long as it's sort of related to drifting. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> that's our that's our primary audience. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so to begin with, um, I think Greg's going to go through a little bit of news, if he can find his uh, notes on things. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I'm trying to share to get us a, a few more people watching. Um, okay. Yeah, um, news wise, we... all I sort of kept up with over the weekend was IDC had their big. Uh, 20,000 20, euro event uh, and Aussie Michelana was pretty close to taking the EG, I didn't realise you had a baby mate yeah, sorry, dude. I'm surprised too you just popped <laughs> yeah. out one day yeah, I was pre- just popped I was, out <laughs> just popped out one day that was pretty quick mate just I'm showed up in the skyline <laughs> seat yeah. and you're like oh what <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even question that. I just took it into my house. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure you're supposed to say that sort of thing, but um, okay. yeah, you'll be getting a call from the feds, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Michelana ended up coming second overall. I think a few people were a bit... Uh, were sort of questioning the decision, but he came out on social media and said he was really ecstatic with the the final result uh guys that drive super aggressive and hopefully he's i know he's shown a little bit of interest in trying to come over for cash kings so hopefully we can see him come over to archie for catch cash kings because that would be uh pretty cool because i don't think he does much over on the east coast of australia and sort of keeps himself to idc and, and wa so seeing a young guy who drives that aggressive uh, would be cool to see him come over over this side of the country and show everybody what he's got, but he's definitely, uh, I think, you know, giving himself a, a good name over there because he's done really well all around. So hopefully he can break the curse and he might very well be the first person internationally to win a IDC event if they actually ever let him. Uh, <laughs> conspiracy no. ca- conspiracy <laughs> theory. Yeah, it's, you do kind of see that, don't you? That no one... I think no they, one how, how would... How would uh, Cash Kings work if um, Ken Gucci wins? Does he, uh, like, hey, free trip to Australia and go back again? Pretty much. That's what happens with every other uh, international driver that's, that's won an event. They, they go home with a prize, I'm pretty sure. Well, actually, they probably spend it on alcohol and other sort of entertainment things. It wouldn't be worth very much if he went back. <laughs> Not at the moment. He'd probably have to hold <laughs> on to that for a little while. Or get rid of it as soon as possible because, it, yeah, it's not worth anything. Um, well, I, it'll be interesting to see how he actually does while we're on the topic of, of Cash Kings to see how Ken would actually go uh, driving a V8 and a right-hand drive. I know he drives a little bit in Japan, but his US car is left-hand drive as far as I'm aware. So uh, he, he's going to struggle. He's in a big car, you know, not a crazy amount of power and... Yeah, I'm not sure. I think, uh, can he drive on 255s with that car, EG? Is that right? Or 245s? I'm not sure. I have to have look it up. That's a JZX90, right? Or a yeah, I don't, or actually, I don't actually know how much weight to tie. I usually just look it up. So I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it'll be bigger than it'll be bigger than a three five, so he he shouldn't be down too much grip. But yeah, look, I'd be with a lot of those local guys and guys like Blake if he can get his act together and have the car up there. You know, Ken's. I can't see Ken making it to the top, 
it would be cool if he does. But yeah, it'll be be interesting to see. And there may be, I got word from Luke that there may be another big guest coming. Uh, and yeah, we will see. But it's a bigger guest than Ken, so if bigger that person than actually Ken. really bigger guest than yep. So if that eventuates, uh, <laughs> I'm sure Archie Forrest, will be Forrest Wang. Um, will be packed out. Now, Forrest has been out fairly recently, so it's nobody who's yeah. been out before. So, uh, watch this space and see if it actually eventuates. But isn't yeah. it like a curse for international drivers to like drive really poorly in Australia? No, I don't think so because we've had um, uh, international Matt drivers at DCN events. Yeah, uh, Matt Field's been doing good lately. Uh, Chelsea's getting used to that car, doing okay. Forsberg's won a championship since coming to Australia, so. Who are you no, thinking? like as in, as in, like while they're over here in the comps that they've been invited to, they haven't done so great because they've always been in like borrowed cars. Yeah, but that's standard for anybody, I would say. Um, yeah. But I think Jack did pretty well. It's just a shame that he ended up with car dramas at Mount Gambia. Something can't remember what broke on that, but something broke on that. It yeah, just popped the hose, kind of... I think. It never popped the hose. Oh, but... yeah. yeah popped the cooler popped pipe. Thing. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Nakamura, he, when he came over to DCA, he won the event. And oh, then, did he? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's Rick. Yokoi as well. Yeah, oh, yeah that's sorry. poor judging. Poor judging. <laughs> poor judging. I, uh, I'm going to say I wasn't involved yeah. with that. So... <laughs> So, <laughs> so basically, Shane's point is valid unless the driver's Japanese and then basically EG hands him the win. No, because I wasn't involved with uh, Nakamura. I wasn't part of the judging team. I was a photographer. Uh, Conflict of interest. So yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> and if you weren't throwing banana peels underneath other cars, they might not have done so well. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> anyway. You know the one person I, f- the, the yeah. one I found the most interesting. I can't think of his. I can never. I, I hate saying Japanese names because I'll butcher it. The dude who came over to Mount Gambia last year. Wasn't that Shinji? Yeah, yeah. Um. No, no. You, you mean Yoshi? Yeah, 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 yeah that one. Yeah, like. Drove uh, Stewie's car like super good, like great driving. And then I watch him in D1 uh, uh, FD Japan, and I'm like disappointed most of the time. But he drove like absolutely killer at, at Mount Gambia. So I don't know. What? Just want to see him drive cool because, yeah, nice dude, but yeah, not super consistent in FD. But maybe it's the, the big tires and all that sort of stuff that's holding him back. But I don't know. I don't know. Sure. I haven't seen him. Uh, no, I have actually. I've seen him drift in Japan, but not in a competition. Okay. Yeah. So it's. I think maybe competition's a bit stricter, or like your mindset changes in that sort of thing. Whereas uh, I know DCA people are. It is a competition, but they're sort of a bit more relaxed about it. If that makes sense. Yeah, a little so, bit more free with it. Yeah. They know that if they you know, make a mistake and they get knocked out. That doesn't mean the end of their sort of driving weekend. They still have a, a lot of other things that they can do. Nah, that's not how competitions should work, mate. <laughs> Put on the trailer, fuck off and go home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So we've got Shane on. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, and also uh, Shane's baby. Occasionally. <laughs> yeah, she's very loud. Yeah. She starts to make some noise. Yeah, um, it's got to be known. Okay, so to begin with, uh, I guess we should start off with yourself. Um, so maybe um, go through the sort of intro with you. So where did you start drifting? Yep. Uh, how did you start drifting? Uh, and then what cars you've had and sort of goes from there. Actually, yeah, just where, where, where everything started. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I guess it started in Gran Turismo 3, basically. I 
you know, just liked car games and got Gran Turismo and liked all the cool cars and skylines and stuff. I think back then my favourite car was a GDR 32. And um, that was like while I was still in school. And then um, the started getting car magazines, so I got Drift Battle and Hot Fours and stuff like that. And, yeah, I just saw the drifting thing and I was like, oh, I'll start drifting in Gran Turismo. Um, so, yeah, I just got good at drifting in Gran Turismo, which is doesn't equate to real world <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, I guess it's like it gives you the idea on what you're supposed to do, but like it doesn't translate whatsoever across, like especially when your steering wheel goes from like here to here when in a car you're like, you know, so many turns back in the day. This was ages ago before the, you know, fancy steering wheels that you can get. Um, and then I got old enough to basically buy a clapped out S13 off Pickles Auctions. It actually came up from Canberra, the car that I bought. It oh, was okay. a black, yeah, it was a black S13 with a um, manual uh, non-turbo SR in it. Um, it had had some massive front end hit and the chassis rails had been welded back on together or something. Um, the car was turbo and, you know, all kinds of problems with the car. Um, so I basically just started putting heaps of cool drift parts on it. I hadn't learned to drift at all at this stage. So um, was it, did you say it was NA to begin with or you got it? NA? Yeah, yeah. I got it NA because it was, um, because I got it off Pickles Auctions, it was stated as a, um, stolen recovered. Yeah. And... Somehow, when they recovered it, it had a non-turbo SR in it, even though it had all the, like, wiring and s computer for a turbo. Yeah. Which yeah, is and it really run weird. Right. Actually, did I talk to no, you about it, this before? Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, because I was looking and, at this SR, uh, uh, this S13 at Pickles, the black one. It yeah. Was, it didn't run right. It, was non, it was, had non-turbo engine in it, but everything... Indicated it was, it was turbo. Turbo, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I had that car. Um, I got 150Ks to a tank, I think. <laughs> that sounds broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like, me as my first car and not really knowing anything about it, I thought it was like, oh, that's all right, I guess. It's, you know, <laughs> runs a bit rich. <laughs> <laughs> probably if you actually had like one of those little spark plugs in the back it's probably popping like flames yeah. for, like 15 meters down the road yeah well i i didn't i didn't know any better like i didn't know anything really about cars i just you know grand turismo it just just went um so i had that car put a lot of mods into it but i never really learned how to drift in it i tried going down to um nasho one night and sucked really badly um <laughs> Well, like, I wasn't confident, so I didn't, like, crash or anything. All I did was, like, handbrake turns, and I still managed to almost get myself beached um, on, the edge of a, on the edge of the road or whatever. Um, and then I... Basically, I wanted more power. I wanted a turbo. So I found a turbo car, a SR Turbo, and, um, yeah, basically transferred all my cool parts over into that and started to learn to drift in that. My first drift day was at Wakefield, so I hadn't learned to drift at all before this. I had no idea how to do it, really. Um, so my first drift day was at Wakefield. It was a blue car at that stage. Um, I spent more time in the dirt, eh? Like, if we're doing... Like, if I was learning these days, I'm pretty sure Wakefield would kick me out for... um you know, going off into the dirt so much and that my, at the end of the day, my dash was like so covered with dirt that you couldn't actually wipe the dirt off. It was like that caked on. Um, what year was, was that roughly? Maybe 2007 or eight. Okay. I think, I think, I don't know. It was like the year after I finished high school which was 2007. Yeah, yeah. 2007. Um, yeah, so I basically just started to learn on the tracks. Um, 
eventually went out to Oran Park and did most of my learning out there, I think. Um, just started chasing faster guys because I watched a lot of initial D and I based my entire driving, <laughs> like, learning kind of... <laughs> like, that was my strategy was basically watch initial D, try and learn as much as I could from initial D and then, like, do the same. So, like, when I was chasing faster people like Jason Greenwood and I think Bo Yates as well, um, I just basically went off the mentality of, like, when Takumi was chasing um, the chicks in the Sil 80 on Isuzu Pass, was basically, oh, the car's got four wheels and tyres and similar power to me, so I should be able to match whatever they do in their Sil 80. <laughs> yes. So that, that, that was awesome. my... <laughs> So that was my kind of, yeah, that's how I I learned was basically just chase faster people, try and copy what they did. Um, yeah, and just did as many days as I could. Tried to keep the kind of the engineering side of the, of the car build really simple, like followed the drift, drift Bible and what could just, so Chia said was like basically, you know, you want balance, you want equal grip all around. So while well, most people were running like, you know, good tires on the front and really bad shitty ones on the rear, I was running five nine fives all around. Uh, federals when they were good, obviously. Um Yeah, so I kinda just learnt that way and kept he driving. Was pro. He was pro before everybody else was pro. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm pro even right. now. <laughs> Running expensive um, tires all around, mate. Well, yeah. it it worked because I my car was super reliable. Like from the like from the first drift day, like I barely had any problems. The only thing problems I had I'd like fix before the next event, and they weren't serious ones. So it wasn't like I ever I didn't ever blow up the CA. I ended up selling it when I pulled it out. Um, I only went through like a pair and a half of tires in a drift day back then as well. So like while everyone's, you know, filling up the back of their mates utes with, um, tires like, uh, Ristic was back in the day with his RX-7, like everyone was bringing so many tires and I just had a second pair really for the day <laughs> and that lasted me. So yeah, it was, it was good days. Oran Park, and then um, I did my first comp in 09 at Drift Australia in the Super Drift series. Um, never done... Oh, I think I'd done one comp before that, which was like an initial drift comp day, and I actually managed to win that one somehow. i had never done a comp before, and I ended up beating um, Matt Porter in his 180. Do you remember Matt Porter? He had like the... Max's you know, tyre. Yeah, cool product. Yeah, yeah, the uni group car. Um, I'm surprised that I won because I think he he was just messing around. He I'd, and he spun behind me and I managed to to win from that. I got a cool um fruit bowl as the trophy. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's kind of the beginning. Any oh, yeah. any questions? <laughs> any any questions? elaborations or further further no, explanations? I, no, it was good. I I remember you and you stood out. Uh, your entry was quite different. Your car's a lot balanced because everyone back then would run the grippy tyres in the front and then sort of like the non-grippy or second handies on the back. And so yeah. you made it a lot different. Uh, so you're, you, I think I've got some photos of you coming down the straight on North Course, straight or the under the bridge. And then yeah. it looked so much more controlled and fluid compared to some of the other people where they just sort of got on the gas and sort of baked it around. Bum dragged it. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, it was, that was the standard then, I think, how long you could it pull was. the handbrake for, especially I, down South and I, Yeah. And I hated pulling the handbrake and even to this day, I try and avoid using the handbrake as much as possible just because I hate getting, like, flat spots and then drifting around and I'm going, like, it's just, you know, I want to relax and enjoy my drift, not, like, get, you know, 
RSI in my butt from all the vibrating. <laughs> ah, that's a that's great one. Please that's what I do on a daily basis. Left. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I live my life. Um, um, so Super Drift, you ended up on the podium. I remember. I wasn't there. Uh, no, was I didn't of... actually. I came. I, th- I came fourth. Oh, okay. That's, um, yeah. Yeah. I was on the other side of the planet at that, that stage. It was like the only Drift Australia event from the time I sort of got into it that I actually missed, and it was that one standalone event. But I remember seeing a whole bunch of pictures and stuff, and I I knew you did fairly well. Uh, yeah, I managed um, fourth in that one. Uh, Jim Turner came third, I think, and I think two of the SA guys came first and second. I can't remember who. Um, I was pretty happy with fourth, considering that my steering rack by that stage had like i don't know blown a seal or whatever so like half the time i'd end my run with my steering wheel facing upside down or some other weird direction so i had no real idea which direction my front wheels were facing if that made sense so i was a bit wobbly and not really sure what the hell i was doing Okay. Yeah, and there's a lot of a lot of in Super Drift. There was still a lot of seasoned guys who had done even the full seasons of Super Drift a couple of years before that came and did that one-off round. I'm pretty sure. So to actually yeah. stand up and and I think you're in a pretty mild car compared to I was a lot in, of that field. I I'm pretty sure I had the lowest power out of everyone. I was the only guy running a CA. Oh, I um, didn't know. I still had... How much power did you have? Uh, probably 160, 170. No, I had oh, 130. Uh, yeah, but no, you didn't make now? the... Yeah, but, yeah, but you, you didn't weren't in that four, comp, you, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you didn't, oh, no. yeah, you didn't make top four, dickhead. So. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, did, I just crashed. <laughs> I spun off the course, I think, straight away. I just wanted uh. to get South Circuit track fine. <laughs> yeah, I'd only done one South Circuit day before that, I think, as well. That was my that's first That's because everybody's... Yeah. That's... Really? Yeah. They yeah, stopped running my... South Days because nobody was showing up to them. I know, but that was like, it was really hard to get to. Like, I'd get to North easily. For the South days, it was really hard to get to for some reason. Um, and that's so that a was the last excuse. chance. Well, that was the last chance yeah, to get that, on South. So that's yeah, why that I, was the, I think that was one of the last events, actually, I drove at Oran Park, I think. Because so. that was at the end of the year, 2009, yeah. and it shut down at the start of 2010. I think the only event February. after ours was like... Um, Drifters Unleashed or whatever. Uh, they had IDA had a day. There was a couple of private days. I went to one private day. Oh, before, yeah. uh, but that was, yeah. um, I think that was the skid pan only. Um, and yeah. there was a North Day as well. And that was that was pretty yeah. big. A lot of people went to that day. I think I remember Tim Sorensen also showed up to one of their last just track days and they let him skid the whole thing start to finish without... <laughs> any stress at all like i think over the bridge and then all the way through the dog leg up onto the front straight didn't yeah. care that was probably so. the last idea day yeah, yeah. yeah. i think actually yeah, there was no, project I... d and there was um, drift mob as well so they all had like final days there yeah oh, reminiscing about times where all i did was follow <laughs> on the forums and hope that one day i'd be able to drive and <laughs> and that shit got knocked over it's it's really interesting like the people that haven't been on Oran Park and those that have. It's, yeah, you're yeah. all fucking old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the funniest part is I'm the same age as you and yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. But age is old. I am old. Yeah. Have you got grey hairs yet or? Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you can see them. But, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just losing my hair. Yeah, but I think, I think ever yeah, since I've known you, hair. ever since I've known you, you've been losing your hair. Oh, it's bad, eh? Like it started <laughs> like as soon as I left school, I was already like, it was already going back, and it's just like, oh man, like can't do anything. <laughs> nah, that's just stress. Yeah, it's all stress. Yeah. We blame AG for it. <sighs> no, I'm so sorry. I was I was nice to Shane back then. Yeah, <laughs> like, you were. You were good. You were, gave pointers and helped me improve, and I was, it was I, great. I started at the, around the same time you did. I don't know how I could give pointers. Yeah, I think so. I'm pretty sure I just said that was really cool. Like I love that entry. 
Yeah, that was good. Yeah. yeah, that's that's good pointer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Helps me know I'm on the right track. Clearly more than he gives a few yeah. other people. Well, if they're shit, then they're shit. So. <laughs> yeah. I can, Honesty I can ex- is good. Expand. It's not valued. Yeah. Yeah. Are you driving like, Wakefield, Shane? Yes. Are you doing this Wakefield yes, day? I, oh, I, I need to get. I have a lot, a lot to do still. Probably yeah. less than what you have left to do, but I, I think mine's down to just the tune and hope that it works. Oh, okay. I gotta put new the Acostal development knuckles and cast rods in mine. See, pro, way too much money. Why is Fab's no longer pro? Acostal's pro because it costs more money. <laughs> is it? Share yeah, Acostal full kit is expensive. Oh, I didn't get the full kit. I don't need that. Ah, okay. I only spent a thousand dollars. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, no, I'm not. I'm not wise, fat mate. So, 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 so you got like the adjustable caster, and that's it for the thousand dollars. I got the caster rods, the um, and the knuckle add-on. Yeah. So it's like a drop knuckle as well, because I've got drop knuckles in the rear, but on the front. So I was still running the Nigel some um, NP wonders. So yeah, I was just gonna match drop knuckles all around. Just try something a little bit different as well, because I still get a little bit of steering bind on full lock. That's a bit awkward to get off sometimes. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, maybe I'm just re- going to drill holes in my strut tower and try and put S14 gear in my 32. <laughs> if I actually get the cradle back in the back of it, so. Yeah. Do it. Oh, are you going to try and do it before Wakefield? Yeah, I'm just going to drill, and I think I'm going to like take the hat off another uh, strut and just mark the holes out and just drill holes into it and see how that works. If it doesn't work, I'll just put the standard stuff back in. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah. Nathan, Nathan Greenhill just did it on his 32, so take a look. At, he's got some decent pictures from up the top and all that sort of stuff of where he where he drilled through, so take a oh, look. okay. Did it look easy? Uh, he looked like he did like pretty extreme compared to that 32 from Tazzy. Like, the one in Tazzy didn't look like it. He had moved it all that far, but Nathan's looked pretty far. So, but it looked fairly easy. He had to cut out a little bit from inside the wheel well and all that to make it work. Oh, really? But, I was yeah. I was trying to do like the minimal amount of work. So, like four four holes each time, um, each side. So, one, two, three. Isn't and that the, three? And the, no, it's it's four. Oh, like, the big one in the middle. Yeah, yeah, middle. Yeah. So, and then yeah, so that on each side, and then just see if it works. If it doesn't, then I'll just put the stock gear back in. So basically, don't follow EG for the first half of the day. <laughs> yeah, basically, because either the well, I'm not sure I'd want to be anywhere near him because either the the whole coil over and wheel knuckle everything's going to come flying <laughs> off towards you. <laughs> 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 um, but, yeah, just all the whole thing's going to flop. So uh, yeah, let's avoid him. I'll be all right. <laughs> You'll cut straight after the bash, though, Shane. It was already hey? clean. You're cleaned up the front end after yeah, yeah, running into yeah. the back of a few people's cars. Aiden, I yeah, oh yeah, I only ran into Aiden's car because the S14 in front of him like spun out and didn't leave him any room, so he had to stop and I had nowhere to go, so I just ploughed into the back of him. Um, pushed all the metal on mine back a fair bit. Somehow the lens on the headlight survived. I don't know how that works when metal gets bent and the like the plastic headlight somehow just doesn't break at all so save me two hundred dollars for getting (laughs) another one of those even that one okay Um, but yeah it's all pretty much fixed up i just gotta um cut out my stickers again to where i re-sprayed yeah where my dad did yep so, um, from your sort of fairly low power SR, uh, your cars sort of changed a bit. It's changed color, uh, the style yes, sort of changed has. a bit, and the engines changed. What, yeah. what sort of things have you have you done since? Well, I guess the, nine the years beginning. ago, or eight, yeah, nine years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll run through all the styles. So the first style style was um, I had kind of like the early '90s style of like sixteens the Bomex front aero and the ducktail wing. Yep. I then, should have kept it. 
That looked cool then. Should have kept it. Yeah, I was before everyone made it. Yeah, I was before it was cool. Um, and then I decided, no, I want like the lip kit thing. So I went CA lip, um, fa- Type X skirts and Bomex rear bumper, and I put the duck and I put the duck tail back on. Um, and then I went 17s because my dad started using the car for super sprints, so and he wanted a bit more braking in the front, so um, he wanted bigger brakes on the front, and so basically it cancelled out my 15s, so I had to go 17 inch. So then I kept the lip the lip kit and went 17s. I got a lower profile um, ducktail just so I could see out the back of the car when I was reverse parking. Because <laughs> the oh, other this one, is when it was like, registered, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was still yeah. registered. Um, so I went the lip kit style, and it was basically that style, I think, up until I um, took it off the road in 2011. Um, engine-wise, it was still CA up until the, the year after the Drift Australia, because after I came forth in the comp, I was thinking, like, maybe I should start doing comps. I should get a bit more power because I would know that I had a lot less power than a lot of other guys out there. So I decided to put a um, SR in it, sold the CA setup. Um, so I went SR. I still had the disco potato in it. So I've had a disco potato while it was CA and I just put the disco on to the SR as well. Um, still normal SR box. Um, I actually learned to drive with a half buggered gearbox as well. So the synchros in going into third gear were like non-existent basically. So you couldn't upshift under or you couldn't upshift under power. So I basically learned to drift without doing like clutch kicks or smashing different gears and that kind of thing. Um, Cause it was a real struggle during the drift Australia round because You know, it was like a drag race start back then. So every gear change was like grind into a gear, grind into the next gear, trying to like keep up with everyone. Because usually when I'd start drifting, I'm not like, you know, smash the foot to the floor and drag race off the line. I was always like, I'd always do the warm up lap and stuff. Um, So then I went SR. And then what did I do after that? I found a um, 326 power kit in newcastle for cheap only one in australia at the time bought it slapped it on the car went nine went um 18s all around the kind of dinner plate and i tried to pioneer the dinner plate wheels like um haraguchi w- was doing with the 326 power cars back in the day yeah with just the you know fancy chrome wheels so i was trying to do that but my, obviously my car was still pretty high because i liked the handling of it <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do the low car shit handling thing. Um, then I wrecked the kit and then I went to um, the G Corp kit that I did now and I resprayed it as well when I went the 326 power. And then, um, yeah, still on 18s, going more of the kind of GTR 2005 style now with a bit of glitter. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you did. Um, uh, I, I remember. I remember you did ADGP uh, around the time you were using the uh, dinner plates. Yep. And then. Yeah, that was the that was the first um, ADGP round at Calder Park. Yeah. When um, everyone was in the same field, so there wasn't like a pro class and cheapo class. Class. Well, that that was tire rules then as well, right? Or basically nobody was showing up with not many guys were showing up with semis or whatever at that stage. Um, I don't know. I I can't remember if there were any tire rules. I was just using cheapy, like I was still just using kind of cheaper rubber then, just because getting because uh, by then like getting um federal five nine fives back then were like they were shit car shit tires by then so i was just running on just whatever i could get my hands on yeah okay 
Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember them. Being, oh, I remember. No, I think maybe it's where they were, had two manufacturing plants and they had the one in Taiwan and the one in China. And so, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Because of uh, the Chinese ones, which really didn't last, they just delaminate. Um, yeah. But the Taiwan one. Yeah, ones, that's right. Yeah, they'd actually last. So. Yeah, I think it was yeah. just the, the gamble of when you order the tyres, which batch would actually turn up. Um, because you can ask them, I want the Taiwanese ones, even though it's still China. They, they want, uh, the, yeah, you know, yeah. want the Taiwanese ones because they were the ones that actually lasted. So I think that's yeah. what that I don't... was. Yeah, it was. I um Yeah, I didn't go back to them after that. Okay. I've just been trying different tyres ever since. Yeah, it's um, it's been pretty interesting trying to figure out a decent set of tires that you can get uh, easily and affordably. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the next sort of thing that we found was we uh, the Kenders that we use in Japan, so they were quite good. And then uh, we've been told they've been discontinued, but they still seem to be floating around. And there's some places still buying them, available brand new, but other places. They, they just don't exist anymore. Like they said, yeah. there's six left and in the warehouse and that's it. And then do you want them? And it's like, yeah, okay, that's it. But that's that's all that's left. And they said, they're not going to get any more. But then another batch will pop up somewhere else. So I, I don't know what's going on with them. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah the tie game's been really weird because like these days for 18s, you just get whatever the cheap Chinese ones that Fernando World has in stock. And they're like different every second, like every second event. Oh, okay. They're like, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, like, even Thai guys I was with last year would only get a certain number of each one, of each brand in, and then that was it, potentially for 12 months, and then it was just sort of whatever else came in. So maybe it's time that we all start group buying and and choose what we want, (laughs) get in a couple of shipping containers and just be done with it, (laughs) rather than this, the the lucky dip of of no idea what you're actually going to get. I think everybody's pretty set on running... 235 18s now i don't think you know there are a few guys running on on other stuff but i think most people are sort of sticking to that generic size i don't know what eg does he's probably running bloody 105s 105, or some shit 215 45 17 <laughs> oh so traditional <laughs> <laughs> or 235 45 17 on the skyline what, whatever's whatever's at, around the back of the tire place when you raid it at 2 a.m uh, no, I'll go there in the morning and ask them. And then oh, that's, usually that's polite. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll try and be nice because they, they save a couple <laughs> if you're nice. They'll, they'll pick out the good ones for you. So yeah. you don't have to dig around in a scrap pile. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. Uh, Greg? EG. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so from there... So during this that sort of time, you were also helping out with designing a track. Uh, so this one. Being I think. Not, yeah. let, let, let's go before I even designed this track. Okay. Like I know because I'd messaged him years before. Like I knew from the IDA forums that he had and uh, Nissan Sylvia forums that he had been pretty active on trying to chase up every lead he possibly could in and around yeah. New South Wales and trying to make. Um, something happened. I think, especially once Oran Park closed, and then there was sort of the big resistance at uh, Eastern Creek to let you know more than a couple of corners happen. That you were pretty active in contacting lots of facilities. I know you contacted a lot of driver training facilities that have sort of little little tracks awesome. and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. And you know, what sort of responses were you getting from from all those places? And uh, a lot of people like, well, you know, it should be as simple as setting up a street event or it should be as simple as going to these places. What, you know, what are the resistances and what are also the policies and stuff in place that you've learnt through all this, um, and I'll call it bullshit, all the bullshit you've been through to try and find a place to go skip. Yeah, um, yeah. so after Oran Park disappeared and Eastern Creek... Like, we started driving Eastern Creek pretty soon after Oran Park disappeared, but it just wasn't the same because of, like, the corner limitation and only doing one run and waiting for ages and, yeah, just so, growing up in that. This was yeah, South Circuit, that? wasn't it? No, yeah. this was before South Circuit. This was okay. before they'd even built South Circuit. We're still on the 
Um, Because at the start, driving sports could only do turns um, 9, 11, and 10. Turn, yeah, 9, 11, and 10. But it really wasn't turn 9 because you started on turn 9. So it was like, do you want to just do like a quick as you kind of came out of turn 9? Like it didn't count. So it was 10. It was the um, the world time attack layout, basically, which was fun and fast and stuff. But just doing one run, one run a lot of wait time. It was just a bit killer. Um, I basically, because I just sit at a desk all day, and I had access to the a few websites that had a lot of like current satellite images of New South Wales and stuff. I basically just started scouring the earth looking for anything that looks skittable. <laughs> um, and basically, as soon as I'd find a spot that was, you know, far away from people, had good access, um, just looked like, hey, we oh, that would be a cool place to drift. I'll start contacting people. Um, I tried Sydney... Um, Olympic Park, because they had, you know, after the Olympics, they had so many cars, like, parking lots around the site that it was like, well, why can't we skid it? A lot of people would would mention, oh, there was a skid pan at this place, whatever, you should, you know, contact them, see if we can do one that's drifting or whatever. And so I'd, you know, find out who to contact, who to call, um, I'd send off an email, some longer than others, just based on how much time I had on the day. I should have been working, but I was distracted and, you know, <laughs> excited. To drift. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm like, I'm going to put a bit of effort in and spend half my day concocting an email to see possibilities with them. Um, so I contacted Olympic Park. I'd tried councils. I'd tried individual businesses. They just had a really big, like, trucking site or whatever and say, hey, could we drive this place? Could we use it for motorsport? Um, eventually I stopped using the word drifting and just have it as, like, a motorsport event because I was noticing that if I used the word drifting, it was just, like, a straight answer of no. Um, that's when I actually got a response. Sometimes I'd, you know, just not get anywhere at all and it wouldn't, you know, it's kind of, all right, well, I tried, but couldn't get anywhere. Um, one place I found, which was down like near Wollongong, it was like an old section of highway that had been um, rerouted slightly. And so there was this basically 400 metre stretch of, unused road that was about four lanes wide and I thought well we could drift that I mean no one's using it it's already there we don't have to build anything we just you know go down there unload skid it it's just a straight line so just do manges and you know kind of just circles you know at the end or whatever and come back just like street style um so I'd contacted the council with that and they said that it was actually um, owned by the mining company that was nearby. But I also needed to talk to the local Aboriginal elders to get permission okay. as well. And I, yeah, because like they responded and I talked to them on the phone and they were like, oh, I want to put in a DA to run an event on this little stretch of road that's not being used anymore. And they'd come back with all these hoops that I should jump through to get it to happen. Um, they also asked me to talk to RMS. I spoke to RMS. This is like this isn't happening like in two or three weeks. This is happening over months. Like the, the whole process wasn't fast at all. And I'd be regularly like, you know, all right, I've sent a thing off to this group or company or whatever and now I'll send off well, like next week I'll find another spot and start the whole thing again for another spot um, yeah it just basically every time I'd get somewhere I'd always find this unbelievable roadblock that would just stop it from going any further so I'd just give up and move on um, I'd actually tried Port Kembla 
about three years before um, Chev managed to score it, which was, yeah, because I, like, the owners back then sounded keen and interested and, you know, wrote up a full, like, four or five-page proposal about what I wanted to do out there. Um, they said, oh, yeah, it sounds interesting. I'll just have to talk to the boss of ProCart, who owned it at the time, about about it, and it just went quiet and dark and I'd be chasing up and they're like, oh, sorry, the boss hasn't been in or blah, 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 excuse, excuse, and then I just gave up. It's not going to happen because you, you just fart assing around. It's been a year. Like, I'm not getting anywhere with you guys. Like, that's how long it's taking to, like, get responses back from some of them after putting in a proposal sometimes it was just yeah it was very disheartening um and eventually i started to go down the the cams route of infiltrating cams and trying to like get things to happen i remember that that was the uh, From, when they had the drift committee or something like that wasn't it yeah they had a they set up a cams drift panel because I can't remember the initial reason why they wanted it set up. One of the chicks in cams actually said, oh, you should have a panel because you've been running under cams for so long, but there's no actual panel to, like, kind of govern the discipline. And um, so, yeah, a panel was set up. I joined the panel just because I'd been trying to get tracks happening and all that. Um but yeah, cams ended up just being another dead end where nothing happened. Long story short, really, that we didn't get anywhere with cams. Well, realistically, anyway, cams from a drifting point of view is all but dead in a lot of ways because there are very few events actually running under under their insurance now. Everybody's moved away from them and gone to Double ASA and Racer because it just makes more sense and with even now with cams new rules on cages and everything it's it's almost because to to want to go drifting is almost unobtainable for for the average person if they were you know if it was all to run under a cams uh banner anyway but. yeah um because i because i started to because i joined the panel and then i chaired the panel for a year i think it was just a year um but by the time that i got to that stage we didn't have um any drifting anymore at um north or south circuit by this stage like we didn't have any cams events so it was like just this panel governing a discipline that isn't run at all so it's like well what what's the point of having a cams panel for drifting if there's no drifting under cams um and I said to them, like, we, well, we have no events. Can we have some, like, we need some events. Like, the, you know, it's kind of stating the obvious and they're all talking about all their events that they do every year and I'm sitting over in the corner. I was like, I've got no news because we've got nothing. We have no events. Like, come on, Cams, are you going to help us get something happening? Um, I spoke to some of the guys that were on the panel as well that, ran their own um, series, like the Twilight Super Sprints. The guy that organises that club was on the panel and I was talking to him and was like, oh, if you're running a Super Sprint out there or a, like a Time Attack, whatever, would we be able to, would you be able to help us get a drift event out there? And um, again, that didn't eventuate or he didn't end up really helping at all. It was... Yeah, it was just a waste. Like So from, from being on that side, though, what do you feel like the resistance was? Or do you think just because it's, you know, low numbers compared to, you know, I guess when you when you put all grip racing into one, you know, one big pocket, even though, you know, many different disciplines of it, and then you put drift in its own just because it's so segregated? Or is it, you know, did it feel like there was more than that? Um, I think... Even still to this day, I think that drifting is just not understood from outsiders. Um, even like people in the in cam still don't really understand what drifting is. Like they ask, "Oh, do you like wet the circuit or put oil down and stuff?" And you're just like, 
your cams oil down like you like whatever <laughs> or, like <laughs> you just i yeah like there's people still just don't understand what drifting is and because when Oran Park disappeared we lost a lot of numbers like drive like driver numbers because uh, during the Oran Park days we had like all the clubs had their own event like every weekend of the month and it got to the point where Lockie couldn't afford to go every week because he <laughs> You know, he just <laughs> physically couldn't go to all the events because there was one, one. You know, like I just remember back in the day, like he just stopped modifying his, like making his car better and looking pretty, and just drove all the time. And he actually got really good with like stock suspension and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I think like ultimately people just don't understand what drifting is like on the out, like people on the other side. Um, plus by this stage, like when I was in cams, we had so like the numbers were just dropping off because there was no events to go to. People are selling up. Um, yeah, it just kind of dropped off. So the numbers weren't really there. So we weren't really considered, a, a like a real force to be reckoned with, if that makes sense, because there wasn't any events to show our, like, numbers and that kind of thing yeah because yeah, um, like... yeah yeah there you go well i was gonna say it just yeah it, it doesn't it doesn't prove viability especially when you're trying to get an organization that big to throw support behind it's like yeah we could help you try and run an event but currently you've you know under our insurance we've got 30 cars with guys with licenses who who drift and that's it so they're probably just like yeah it's not really worth us throwing support and upsetting the rest of our community that couldn't give two shits about about your community but yeah i don't know a bit tragic really yeah and just tracks you know obviously it's their business and cams like ultimately said oh we can't really tell what east we can't tell eastern creek what to do or who to give days to um so that was kind of my revelation in going into cams of like, so you're the governing body of motorsport, but you have no like real sway in the actual tracks themselves. Like even though Eastern Creek is supposed to be a government backed, like government run, like, um, Facility. venue. Yeah. Yeah. But it's actually run privately and they just get money from, the government because um, they actually use drifting as an excuse or not as, as an excuse but as an example of like oh we're going to build south circuit so all these other drifting disciplines like drift like drifting and blah 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 will have a venue to drive at and um, I think driving sports have actually got that um, press release stating that they were building south circuit for drifters and then south circuit got built and then they didn't want drifters on there and then we tried to get on there and then yeah there's a whole big awkward mess with the clubs or the track trying to get the clubs on board so that the clubs would provide the numbers but then the clubs wanted to run their own event and the but the clubs wanted to run their events because they'd been like in the past at Oran Park, they'd always run their events themselves, you know, like Drift Mob had their event, Initial D had theirs, Project D had theirs. Um, you know, everyone ran it how they wanted and that kind of thing, even though they were all very similar. And I think the track tried to use the clubs to get the numbers behind their event or their events um but it was just very poorly mismanaged and communicated to everyone and it just and the track tried to run it themselves but they ended up like diving it into the ground just because they didn't end up having any support behind them like any real drifters behind them it's a bit sad yeah yeah it's the same thing that ended up happening with almost happening with wakefield after after them opening it back up to drifting and 
sort of not getting drifters involved to start with. They had a guy come up from Vic Drift, but who had never actually been to an Orem, uh, to a Wakefield day before and didn't really have much idea on how it had run previously and how it, you know, it was an easy track to manage, but really easy to mess up as well. And the first couple of track days there were really rough because of it. And eventually, you know, I guess for, for Wakefield, I think they've seen some, some dollar signs come out of drifting again uh, because all their other stuff's a little bit slow at the moment. And, you know, they were happy enough to, you know, I think on that first day or one of those, one of those early days, EG ended up on the, the start line managing it for them because they couldn't, they really couldn't organize it. And I think that from that point on, they sort of realized that they probably need, they can have their guys run the flags and do all of that, but then you sort of need somebody in the know running the rest of it. And I think, you know, it sort of shows you that the tracks themselves, unless they're built by a drifter who can who can manage it, it becomes very hard to to actually manage it and make it flow right so that people are happy to come back or else they'll just go find their local spots and, and keep doing what they're probably already doing anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it'll actually get a lot worse and it might actually, like long term, it might actually give us more events on say like Eastern Creek and just other venues because the whole like younger generation are a lot more drift centered. Like that's like, you know, like the youth of today aren't getting into drag racing and circuit racing as much. Like I'm sure there's still like a percentage of young people doing going down that path, but like the mass majority of like, young people these days are wanting to you know get a drift car even though it might just be a like a, a fad for some of them like that's where the new people are is in drifting um but again like so in long term they're gonna you know all the old people that have their porsches and you know all their you know race cars from the 50s or whatever that they love they're all gonna you know like die off and then who's going to replace them it'll be us the drifters but you know we're all drifters and if they don't like drifting then they're going to have a problem long term and they might open it up to us because they'll be like oh we need money so we better get some drifters because there'll be more of us um so i think that long term we might actually start to get somewhere just because you know that's where the motorsport is is young people because uh, even at cams, they were like so surprised at how many spectators they actually got, like showed up at drift events, and how m many young people were into drifting, and how their rally comps or whatever they don't have many young people. It's only like sons of already rally car drivers that are continuing it. It's you know the the new blood or whatever in motorsport is is in our discipline, so to speak. Um, but tracks haven't really seen that as a benefit yet, I guess, because there's enough old people to keep their their events going. <laughs> yeah, I, I get what you're saying. That the, the only issue I see with some of that is that the, the two most affordable sort of motorsports that you can sort of go out and buy something and be out there the next day is drifting, and motorbikes and the two of yeah. them don't don't work well together on the same circuit um as has been issues with most tracks uh which is the saddest part because i think moving forward especially in somewhere like new south wales where even way up the coast or way down the coast you're looking at ridiculous prices for for housing so for most people it's sort of that's an unobtainable goal so let's go have some fun instead and a lot of people are sinking what should be deposits on houses into to cars and just enjoying themselves but yeah it seems like it'll be that sounds it'll be like what you're old. doing greg yeah but yeah basically <laughs> um, <laughs> um hey I, i'm happy to admit it um, but, but it's really it really is drifting old bikes um you look at the yeah. the big fat of, of rallycross globally and you know realistically it's probably not a format that will ever take off that huge in australia because it's a big dollar sport really from a when they when you're talking a formula version of a sport where uh, everybody's got to be in a homologated style caged car and all that sort of stuff, 
uh, especially now that CAMS has come out with all these new rules on gusseting cages in even more places and all that sort of stuff. Like, it's just motorsport it, like that is just going to be more and more unobtainable. And the fact that motorsport is becoming less and less viable for sponsors, they're, they're giving less and less craps about it, really. So unless you've got the pockets yourself to fund it and then, you know, shove some stickers from your own business on the side of your car to, to write that off on tax, then... <laughs> guess what you're not getting into it it's just not happening for you uh you can do some pulsar cup stuff but i think even the hyundai no, excel ex- stuff expensive oh, that, yeah, that, that, uh, say, like, yeah you can't get into yeah, the drifting's uh, the cheapest drifting would yeah, be the cheapest yeah. in, the, in a car kind of like on a track like mo- there's motor carners and other hill climbs and things like that but they're kind of like specialized circuits if that makes sense yeah, yeah and, and being like a national motor carner champion isn't really going to like get you into v8 supercars or like get you anywhere as well because no one will like really know oh, yes well like you, you know the like motor car the people that... actually in camera yeah 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 well, so yeah yeah what, what is that he was I Did, know. didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> he's really freaking fast but uh yeah, yeah. No, he he's... Just, didn't he get raided the other day from the around the back of your house mate oh that wasn't that one no, so they're just good for one. driving away from the police. No, well, I'm the police. Uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, that's probably <laughs> another story I, for another. Uh, story well, another probably stream. shouldn't be spoken now about streaming cause... from Canberra Jail. Eg. <laughs> no, well, okay. So what's been on the news is the place behind mine um, had an attack from a, a bikey, I guess. Mm. So apparently, oh. the bikey's. Uh, having a bit of a, a fight around Canberra and one of the bikes yeah. was behind me. And so the police have been investigating and so they've been very active in my area. Mm. That's a shame. <laughs> Not that uh, you should ever... Yeah. Yeah, just don't upset the bikies, mate, because you've got a yeah. nice car yard there. But I guess if EG, ever, if EG ever disappeared, we know where to go pick some parts for our cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh what were we talking about before that yeah so uh, so because yeah so just yeah drifting being yeah it'll be interesting to see long term where it sort of goes with with a lot of motorsport now being more and more unta- unobtainable uh and i think things are going a little bit more back to basics within australia with the drift stuff so um yeah we'll see and and fingers crossed i hope your prediction is is right, and there'll be a bunch of all us old dudes out there still driving together, which would be, or me hopefully driving if my car works. I'm um, not just sitting in the pits. I might be too old to unload and load a car and not be able to drive. But yeah, well, I, my long term, like me seeing that like coming to fruition of like the you know that generation disappearing is like still 10, 20 years away. So oh, for sure, it's. That that's like long term, and you can actually see Maroon. I think is the only one that I've seen actually, pre- like preempt that kind of stuff with their like cheap car championships and cheap car enduros and all that kind of that kind of series. Like they're the only track that I can see is trying to like embed itself into cheaper, uh, like attainable motorsport. Is that pre pre new owners or post new owners? Um, both. Like I was seeing that before, before the the Shelleys came into power, and um, even after it, I've still seen like they're still running those same same events, like the cheap car stuff. Um, my one gripe about the Marul and stuff, like the new owner, and when they did the like the press release of like oh we're going to cater for all the youths and like allow them to get off the street and you know enjoy motorsport in a safe environment but like you know as i said before like all the youths are into drifting so it's like yeah you just kind of want to cater to the youths that like your form of motorsport not the youths off the street you just want to run your circuit like you know you want to run your super sprints or whatever and just so, and just use the you know the buzzwords for the media to kind of show your your niceness. 
Yeah, are they in when? Yeah. You, when yeah, when you're going through a lot of the stuff you've been going through, uh, I know uh, Sydney Motorsport Park. You know, being government run, faci- well, a government owned facility, sinks yeah. a whole lot of money into it. But but with these other tracks, are they looking for government grants and all that sort of stuff when they're looking at these major track upgrades and things like that? I know the Shelley situation is probably a little bit different because I think that was a lot of out of pocket themselves. But uh, do they go hunting for grants and stuff from the government? Um. I I honestly have no idea about that side of it. Yeah. I know that Rawlin was built out of um, Gary, the owner's back pocket, basically. Um, he just had a lot of money and wanted to build a track, and so he poured, you know, his money into that track. Um, so that was all, you know, private money. I haven't really heard of any, like, government backing from motorsport because generally, oh, we support Eastern Creek, so that's where our support for motor, you know, like that's how we tick our motorsport for the public box is that track. Yeah. So I haven't really come, like, they they might try and seek out grants because I think um, Wakefield was actually maybe getting money from council because of some report came out of how much money they were like Wakefield was actually bringing to Wake like to Goulburn. Goulburn. Yeah. Um, and so I think Goulburn's actually like, Oh, maybe we should, you know, give them a bit of support money wise so that we can keep getting more money, you know, like, yeah. So well, I think like, yeah, I think Goulburn's a, is, is a good example with all that because I remember the, the one Revo day I did before it got shut down and, the owners of the motel that I stayed at were like, oh, we didn't know what's on. Maybe we'll come out during the day. And it was a, I think it was a Monday event. And they're like, oh, we might, you know, when we're quiet in the middle of the day, we might just pop out and, you know, come out and watch. And uh, most of the places on the Sunday night when we went out for dinner are, are dead. And, I, you know, there's only a couple of reasons you actually go to Goulburn. Uh, one of them isn't ideal. Uh, you're, you're probably not paying to stay there. Uh, the second reason is because you're visiting somebody who's not paying to stay there. <laughs> and then the other reason you're going down there is all, like it's just a stop spot between Sydney and Melbourne, really. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't mention flamingos, but yeah, sure. There's flamingos there? <laughs> I, I know the, there's a big set of rams nuts. The, 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 yeah. clu- the, the club, because I remember like when Oran Park, not Oran Park, um, Wakefield was popular like you'd go down with all your mates the night before and then go to flamingos or whatever the <laughs> night before i only did one day before it closed and i had no friends then i probably yes. still don't have many friends now so oh, yeah yep. we know where sh- we know where shane's and eg's digs were uh, flamingos. <laughs> i never went i never i was as soon as the event ended i was like i'm i'm getting out of here i'm going back to sydney well it feels only an hour and 15 from my place so it's not really that oh. I don't need yeah. to yeah. stay there. Stay there. Yeah. I just go but home. if there's flamingos, each is down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my sounds, gosh. Like, so, sounds shady. Yeah. Well, like, that's what you... Like, I remember seeing people post photos of flamingos on a Sunday night and, you know, like, there's six people on the dance floor. So, you know, it's pretty, pretty quiet. Sounds drift, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah, sounds pretty lit, really. Yeah, oh, yeah, so lit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we sound old. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've lost where I'm at now. So I guess moving forward, after all your uh, BS of chasing tracks and, and being turned down, uh, you've ended up, well, you ended up doing the design and helping with some of the logistics of uh, Ludnam Raceway out in uh, yep. Western Ludnam. Sydney. Yep. Um, so that actually came about one of the driving sports guys, Tom, actually tagged me in their their like Facebook page that they were starting. They were wanting to build a racetrack on their property. Um, and the image that they had of their track looked like it'd been drawn in paint or like something really dodged. Like they had hairpins that like had like points, like points, like as the inside (laughs) clipping points kind of thing, you know, like obviously it was still early days or whatnot, but, 
Um, by then, I was well into drawing up circuits and drawing layouts of places because I'd found many, like, empty land sites, um, a few that were close to me as well. So I'd started drawing up actual layouts because I'm a drafter by trade. So I'd been drawing layouts for, like, a year or so before that. Um, I just messaged them and said, oh, I've got a few layouts. Maybe you might like them. Or whatever for your track just let us you know just whatever um and they really liked him and they're like oh yeah that's great would you be able to like you know draw up some designs for the for our track and i was like yeah sweet i'll just draw up a whole bunch and maybe come out have a meeting with you guys and so i got together maybe like 10 other drifters to come out like put the call out on the facebook of like hey going out to ludnam to talk about drift like tracks and drifting um got like 10 guys together from you know varying levels of like street drivers to pro um so i got those guys together and we all went out and sat around their kitchen table and i handed out maybe like 20 odd designs that i'd drawn up for their site um showed them different places that i'd like to drive um, especially with like Google Maps so you could go to all the cool Japanese drift tracks and so I printed out some of them and gave like the layouts like to them as kind of inspiration and that kind of thing because I'd use them as inspiration for what I'd drawn up um, yeah so I just gave them designs and just kept talking to them built the relationship um, yeah and just just went with it really just kind of tried to started to learn the contours and went out to site one day um, met one of the other guys who was like a civil drafter so he was going to do all like the technical drawing side because I'm not um, I don't know how to do civil like road good road civil design yet um, so he was going to do like the technical side, so all the the falls and elevations and cambering and all that. So he was going to do that side, and I was going to look after the actual like concept design side of it. Um, yeah, so I basically went out there, checked out all the elevations, and tried to kind of come up with a layout that would, you know, min minimize how much earthworks because it's quite a hilly place. Like you, you've all been there, yeah. Yeah, I've been out there. I've yeah. been hiding. Yeah. yeah, so like it's heaps hilly out there. So I kind of wanted to try and make a track that utilized the hills as like, you know, kind of elevation change, but also minimized like the amount of earthwork that they'd have to do to the site. Because, you know, the more earthwork you have to do, the more expensive it gets and blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, so I just tried a few different layouts, tried to follow the contours and that kind of thing. And, yeah, the design kept going. I ended up doing the go-kart track as well. Um, they decided to go down the path of doing like a staging staging um, build. So stage one was the go-kart track. Stage two was the paintball place. And then, yeah, stage three was the main circuit. Um, yeah, so we did the go-kart track. So I designed the go-kart track, and that's been really fun. Um quite a challenging track as well to get good lap times on which i'm yeah i'm just stoked that it was a cool cool track to drive and it wasn't um you know kind of bland like straight corner straight corner straight corner it was a bit of bit of twist and a bit of um like double apex and kind of what line do you take and that kind of thing um and then a few years later they did paintball and then quite a few years later, they finally built the track, which was finished in um, February this year. And it was there was a time when it wasn't actually going to get built or there was a massive hurdle because the new M12 highway that they're wanting to build with the, the new airport that they're going to actually be putting out in the area, um, one of the designs for that highway was basically straight through the back half of the circuit that I designed for them, um, which was pretty shitty. <laughs> this, yeah. You know, it's, it kind of turns the like, yeah, it's going to get built to like, I don't know if it's going to get built like 
if there's going to be a highway going through the back half of it, like, are they still going to be, be able to build or is they going to have to... Yeah, so it was um, a bit hit and miss there for about six months because they were supposed to break ground, like, a year earlier and then they got the the thing in the mail that, hey, we're going to build a highway in your backyard. So then it was like, oh, crap, like, now we've got to... They had to go to council, get someone out from council to, like, basically try and get them to, like, hey, put your highway somewhere else. You're going to hurt their local economy and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, eventually they put it somewhere else, which was lucky. And so, yeah, it ended up getting built. Um, I guess the, the bad part about it all is... Um, I got a lot of negativity from everyone the whole way through. They're like, they're not going to let us on. Like, it's not going to, or it's not going to happen. Like, as you know, like a pipe dream kind of thing. Um, and the whole way through, because like I'd been, been involved from the get go, told them I was a drifter from the get go. Like, they were into drifting. Like, they like, you know, they like drifting. Um, they're the whole like, hall for their go-karts is covered in like formula d drift cars um and they like drift so i never really like i'm not sure at what point they that changed or whether i just never asked the question of like if they were actually going to let drifting happen yeah because on, everyone on, was an yeah. assumption that it would would happen yeah, and I'd been telling everyone, like, it's going to happen. We're going to be able to drift it. I designed it for drifting. Like, they haven't said no drifting, but I, yeah, they. Um, well, yeah. I guess that also let people skid the go-kart track. Like, I know one of my mates has driven an S13 on the actual go-kart track itself. Um, and yep. I'm sure you've potentially had a car out there at yes, some stage as well. Yeah, I've done a few um, things out there, mostly like after hours. And last time I did that was Christmas Eve, if, like last year, I think, or the year before. I did Christmas Eve just for like all the staff just to enjoy themselves. And yeah. one earlier on when they just opened. Um, like, yeah, you can skid it and it would probably be just as much fun as like the London track itself if it was like an extra, like if it was like scaled up to like two times or whatever, it would probably be awesome. But yeah, it's just, it's way too tight for actual drift cars. Like it's, it's a one line track. So if yeah. you're offline, you're off track. Yeah. And then that one chicane sort of down before the last corner is probably near impossible to get a like a, a full size car through would probably be pretty slow. Um, yeah, well, by the because I I can actually drift through it, but by the time you get to the other side, you're so slow that you just need to like dump the clutch and like bake it to keep drifting. Yeah, or, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> you're sliding. not, you're not. Yeah, yeah, to keep the rear wheel sliding, you'd have to like just dump the clutch, and I'm that's just not my driving style of just dumping the clutch and clutch and you know, creating smoke. I just drive, drove out of it, got speed up and hit the last corner. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure at what point that changed. I know the track itself, um, since they've started building the main circuit, they've had a lot of customers come in or a lot of people come into their, like the go-kart place and, and just be very like rude and disrespectful towards them and tell them, they should have drifting and just being very like not kind of respectful of any of decisions that they may or may not have made yet. Um, cause when the, cause they, they are quite in the know and they are quite, um, connected to the drifting community so that when the whole issue about the, like South Circuit and all the clubs pulling out and trying to boycott it and, you know, Sydney Monopoly Park and all that kind of stuff went down. They were very much watching all that and became quite discouraged from that, from seeing all that happen on social media and, 
yeah, just seeing, I guess, the rise in social media of like, you know, the keyboard drifters being assholes and, you know, saying their two cents and swearing and just being jerks um, on the net has kind of just given that bad kind of image for us. Um, yeah, and so when I found out and made that, like, that, post up saying that all right i'm i was wrong Dr- drifting's not going to happen until maybe next year which is still still the plan so early next year i'm hoping to run like a small test day um with a few good drivers that you know can keep it off the grass so th- hopefully that still goes ahead next year um but even then it would only be like we'll be on only be able to drive it maybe two or three times a year, if that. Um, so yeah, next year we'll start testing. So what on... was the reason? What's the reason you're saying a year's time? Like I know, but it's probably better coming from your mouth as to sort of the reasons they've given you. Um, so one of the reasons that Simo, the like the manager there, gave us was the um, the asphalt engineer actually said that you should wait a year for the asphalt to cure fully before running drifting on it. Um, because we, because asphalt's, um, like close to a liquid still, so it can still shift and move and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not really sure on the, like the technical engineering side on why their engineer said that. And then it comes back to like, do we actually know if the engineer knows really what drifting is or does he think we put oil down or, you know, that kind of... Yeah. I, I don't really know the the real reason, if that makes sense. I know the re you know, I know that that's what they said is oh, the, to let the track actually cure um, as yeah, well as, yeah. One of the big things is... You know, other tracks they be resurfacing, and you can get out there and drift it straight away, pretty much, or even create a new surface because I, I guess that is a, a new track rather than laying uh, resurfacing an existing track. Um, yeah, and yeah. They can you can drift on it straight away, um, but it's yeah, it seems kind of strange that they would say that, and that's 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 just your point, like what the real truth is. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it, like it doesn't it doesn't really make sense. I'm just kind of like, well, that's their decision, so I'm just going to you know respect them for their decision, even though I might I don't really understand. Um, obviously, they also don't want you know people coming off and spinning out because they do still see drifting as quite a wild like sport to do you know like because you do get a lot of people spinning out and stuff like that as opposed to you know what people do in their normal racing yeah when they come off there's a high chance that people will keep their foot into it and actually dig out and dig dig holes and stuff like that yeah and then even when they're told not to they still sort of they might like push the limit and then you know they don't get told off for it but at the end of the day, there's a big sort of rut on the side of a of the track, and even like even with the ruts, it uh it, you know it digs out with the support that the asphalt has, and then when you push against and it, crumbles. Yeah, yeah, you break the track. Yeah, yeah. So like during my design, during like the design phase, I was saying like you should really seal the edges up with concrete so that like if people do go off like for drifting and that kind of thing, they'd be damaging concrete and not the asphalt because the concrete is the thing that's breaking up. Yeah. Um, they ended, I, they didn't end up actually following through on that. There's, you know, like hindsight, there's so many things that I wish I'd detailed more and like put more firmly towards them as what they needed to have in like in the track. Um, yeah, in hindsight, and they also changed changed things after I'd like kind of you know stepped back and let them do the more detailed design work 
of just you know kind of like all the grading and the stormwater and that kind of thing um because i'd originally designed it to be run um anti-clockwise whereas they're running it as um clockwise so rather than going up the hill and turning right along a big boring sweeper to the right you'd actually be coming out of that flying down the hill getting a hell of a lot of speed up and hitting basically the same shape as um mihan circuit slash same shape as minami but different kind of contour elevations um so if you yeah if you look at the track again you can kind of see the same like kind of corner style so it's like a very long high radius left into a very tight left yep so you're flying down the hill you should be able to hit fourth easy going down or oh, i've hit fourth going down the hill and you basically just kick it hard at the wall and then you know slide into the corner itself um slowing down and you know an actual drift corner you know non-powered like just sliding into it with the hill so i'd basically design that corner as like the comp corner that if we ever get to do drift comps on it would basically be to use that corner so power is negated because you the more power you use the faster you go down the hill which gets even more scary because you know eventually you're going to be going too fast um but it'd still allow for like the lower powered cars to catch up yeah yeah it's cool that you consider those type of things um yeah so is is there any other parts of the track that sort of you've considered um where other people don't understand why you've made it that way um yeah based like basically pretty much every single corner i've tried to base it off another corner that i've driven or a corner that i've seen and wanted to like replicate um so i've wanted in my original design i actually had to like kind of inroads cutting through the middle of the site so that you'd actually be able to break it up into two um so one side was going to be a lot more tight and technical which is where the two hairpins come in up at the start of the course and then the second half was going to be a lot more um longer sweeping kind of corners yeah and the and the downhill and the downhill corner was going to be on that side as well so i wanted to have that kind of like you know beginner easy corners because the first two hairpins are literally like one radius around so they're very simple corners so it's not like you're the racing line to take is awkward because you need to you know be heaps wide or heaps tight for one corner so you line yourself up for the next or anything they're very simple corners um so but then yeah Ludnam wanted to not have the infield crossover bits because they wanted to save money in that regard they didn't want to you know build more road than they needed to yeah um, so again, that kind of came down to they don't really understand the depth of what I was trying to do, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. They just saw what they wanted, and so I'm like, all right, well, if that's what you want, then that's what you want. Um, I guess that's, yeah, that's the challenge. Yeah, the, the, it's privately owned, so they're paying for it. So they kind of, they, they're allowed to make the decisions. You can kind yeah. of influence what, you know, <laughs> how their decisions are made, but ultimately their track, they'll do it their way. Yeah. And that's yeah. like, that's the, that's the line to like take away from this is like, it's their track. They can do what they want. So you just need to be respectful of that and yeah, just deal, deal with that, I guess. It, but again, it's like, it's different for Eastern Creek because they're government back. So like, if you want to go drifting, you need to, like, you know, legally, you need to ask the government, like, hey, we can't drift legally. Where can we do that? And like, oh, at Eastern Creek. And it's like, yeah, but they won't let us. So, yeah. yeah. When it's privately owned, you kind of, you just got to respect it. Um, so, yeah, I'm still trying to 
get us get us there eventually as much as you know me being able to drive the circuit is it's not really i don't feel like i've succeeded at all in my in my goal you know like this whole time i've just wanted to get somewhere so that everyone can have fun again like Oran park yeah and and drift like i'm still i still remember those days vividly and the friends i made like you know, I'm still friends with, you know, you, Joey, like all the original drivers from back in that, in that time. Um, yeah, like we still remember it and enjoy it. And so many new people have come and we still made friends in the drifting, but we see each other a lot less. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that also plays into why there's so much like, um, con, not conflict, but like, Conflict. Yeah, like <laughs> I guess it's, I was trying to think of a different word. But nah, it's just yeah, like that's I see that as like that's why there's so much conflict in the drifting community as well is because we're not drifting together that yeah. much. Um, yeah, we're too busy with too much time on our hands to and thinking about drifting, but not actually, you know, drifting's not in the palm of our hands, so we need something to do with it. So we end up doing that. Um, so, but is there, with the, the track now, I know they got cams fairly heavily involved with, um, their safety stuff and originally and they, they did. Yes. Yeah. I don't um, think they are now, are they? They're, no, they're not. Okay. Um, so another thing that shits me about cams is they actually changed the direction of the track. So apparently an FIA standard is for circ like designing circuits which I should have known but didn't, um, was that the first corner needs to be a 90-degree corner, um, which doesn't gel with some of the Formula 1 tracks that I've seen, which are like hairpins first corner and, you know... I was going to say, 90 or, 90 or more, because I know places like China and a few oh, like maybe that... maybe more are than 90 or whatever, but... Yeah, so the first corner was supposed to be a 90-degree corner or whatever, so they actually somehow convinced them to change the direction so that's why it is clockwise now um what? whereas i wanted it anti-clockwise what's their reason Just, for a 90 it's well it's like because it was cams and they were trying to go through cams and that um yeah that idea somehow just stuck with them that they'd do it in that direction i think um in my mind because i I think when you brought that up when we were talking about it, I sort of went why as well. The only thing I can think of is um, uh, they're they're sort of catering towards like the bottom of the field, so not the F1, but anyone that wants to drive that track, which would be the average person or like the the big crowd of people. They don't really know how to drive. They just they know how to drive a car, but they don't actually know how to drive it well. So yeah. if you have a sweeping corner <coughs> that sort of tightens, then you're doing three things. You're, you're Oh, you're trying to manage the corner, go fast, and then also slow down. Whereas yep. if you're just going in a straight line and then turning, you know you just have to brake before that point, and that's it. So it's all just sort of braking. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's less sort of it doesn't stop you from yeah, but it doesn't stop you from t-boning the shit out of somebody if you've <laughs> messed up your braking markers, pull inside the corner, and and drive into yeah. their door. Especially in in this case, like reality is on a on a standing start or even lapping if you try to undertake somebody on that corner you're driving into their driver's door you're not even driving to their passenger's door yeah uh, well, that's, that's, that's least... one yeah you've also got time uh, yeah, as I'm, well yeah it was like i'm sure different. there's so many reasons um one of the reasons why i didn't think that it was going to be an issue was because eastern creek is a sweeping left like um yeah so it's but like it's a, well, but it's a 90 it's, no, it's not. Is it's, it? Well, it's, oh, it's, it's like an extremely long 90, long 90 to the point where you get to the end and you feel like you didn't turn. Or yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> yeah, um, probably. probably. So, is there, yeah. so the, the, I know they changed some of their fencing and all that off the designs because of the direction change of the track, but it still looks fairly safe to run it the other direction? Uh No. Nope. No. <laughs> no. There's a um, <laughs> there's a wall at there's a wall at the end of the straight. So so I when I I have so when I drove drove the circuit um, a while 
a few months back now. I drew, did drive it in both directions because there's no way in hell that I'm just doing clockwise. I went the other way. Um, so basically coming out, if we like flip it around, so the first corner became the last. So coming out of that last corner, basically where the pit entry wall is, which is also a slope like this, like that's how the concrete wall starts is a slope that's 45 degrees. That's basically where you would want your car to, to be on the corner exit if that makes sense so you've immediately got a jump on the course if you were sounds running fun. it the other way sounds fun yeah well like because <laughs> we I'm should a send, confident we should yeah. we should send nick first <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um so yeah there's that like big glaring hurdle and safety problem is that ramp um, but going down the hill as well, once you get to the bottom um, and you're starting, because where the corner starts is right on a flat bit. So as soon as you initiate, you start rising up, going up the hill slightly. Um, so on the right side of the track, there's a big solid flat concrete wall, which would be awesome in the comp because you'd basically come down and clip it on your initial flick. Um, so kind of like going back to the early Manami days when people would come out of the corner, race down the wall and then flick off the wall, if that makes sense. They don't, whereas now they're like flicking before the jump and trying to hold it down the hill. Back in the early days of Manami, they'd run the wall and then flick off it. So that was basically how I was wanting to run the line down through that. So the problem is that the wall, the concrete wall rises up and then there's like a dirt bank that follows it. So around the whole outside, you've basically got this flat wall and a dirt ramp meeting up to the concrete wall. And so by the time that you get to the apex of the corner, it's just a dirt wall. The concrete wall stops. So the problem is that like, you know, maybe eight times out of 10, everyone going down there will, you know, hit it hit the line right or they drift through it and it won't be too many issues. They'll maybe nudge the dirt barrier and spin out or whatever. But like after watching videos of um, Bahoku down near Osaka, um, you know, like the amount of people that have hit that incline that's on the outside edge of the track and actually rolled their cars or gone up the hill and, you know, landing on top of it is a real, like, safety danger thing. And so you couldn't really run it as a comp now because you'd basically be running through that gauntlet of if I screw up in straight line and if or if I get my throttle stuck, you're basically hitting a ramp to launch yourself up into the air and into a pond on the other side. Uh, to so, me, that sounds just sounds like a good idea. Yeah, it just sounds Dukes like a, like a just, Dukes of just, yeah, yeah. Just set it up like uh, uh, they've got over in Japan where they've got the webcams at a whole bunch of the tracks. Just set it up on that point, and everybody would just sit there each day and wait and see who's the first. Yeah, and get the Zaku, the cameraman, to sit right up on the edge there. <laughs> um, yeah, so those two spots alone basically make it like a no-go for drifting in that direction. Um, you could possibly, like, start the run halfway down the straight so that you never get the speed up to clear the, like, the dirt ramp, even though you possibly get stopped on the ramp um, when you spin out. But, yeah, it's still, yeah, it's not possible to run it the direction I want, which is, you know, again in the hindsight of what I wish I'd kind of stated out a bit more about how to do the runoff in this corner. Is it something um, that they can change later? So you could actually... Yeah, you can change. You could change anything. You could, you know, expand it or whatever or, you know, chop the ramp down and just put a concrete wall and extend it out. You could always do that Um but again, that's money and earth moving and all that kind of stuff. And I just want to get onto the track first and yeah. Yeah. So 
you drove it before they laid tar down and then you've driven it only the once since yeah yeah so i drove it when it was just sandstone which was sketchy as because it's like i didn't change anything on the car and it was like you know running a drift car on a rally track you know same stiff suspension and same alignment as i would on a normal track so it was it was very challenging because i needed to try and remember all the like rally only techniques to initiate a drift if that makes sense you could yeah, like rely on the brakes and all that sort of stuff you, yeah and i couldn't rely on the front turn in because i've got so much camber on the front because you know you don't you've you've got grip on a on a tarmac whereas on dirt having no grip on the front wheels because there's so much camber you're just gonna understeer yeah so it was a very challenging challenging way to drive plus it was hell bouncy and there's some pretty heavy rocks out there so i'm trying not to like destroy my car on the dirt um yeah but driving it is probably the most funnest track i've ever driven either way or just the way that it was supposed to go um either, either way either way like i actually think that it's probably safer for beginners to go obviously f for beginners to go the clockwise direction than anti-clockwise yeah and it's just like it's just as fun like going down the hill rather than up is like going down it's way more fun than going up because going up you just feel like you're bogging on the toge course like it had literally the same feeling of like if you were starting to do that first uphill um hairpin on the toge you know like when you go around it and then you just feel like you're just bogging trying to get your yeah. speed to keep going yeah and sometimes, Same, basically yeah you just get wheel spin off the hill and that's it yeah so it basically felt exactly the same as that which i which i kind of like oh yeah that's a bit of a nod to that turn on toge or whatever but it was a lot more fun to go down the hill yeah cool um do you think so? There's a period between when it opened to next year, when hopefully uh, we'll see some drifting on there. Do you think they'll actually make some improvements or changes? Like, is that what that period is for? So, like doing some concreting or some sort of extra things to make it better for drifting or safer? Um, so, when I did go out, I went out there to basically test the circuit and show them what areas are going to be problematic from a drifter's perspective as well as just in general um so there were a few spots where the like the concrete ripple strips needed to be extended um just because they'd stop way too early and right the driving line that you'd be taking would be putting you right against that line so um one of the spots is coming out of the first hairpin corner on the outside edge you can see like my tire marks are like right on the edge of that of the track yeah and i know like obviously if i'm already on the edge of that track just driving it conservatively like how many other guys are going to be you know dropping wheel or two off in that direction as well so i said oh you need to put concrete extend the concrete ripple strip um from other videos that I've seen, I haven't seen that them actually having done any of that yet, though. Um, I think it's just a case of they're happy with how it is and they don't need, they haven't seen any need to pour more money into it, I guess. Yeah, so when, when you actually drove, though, what sort of reaction did you get for them? Like, I know you're in a, like a, a pretty good relationship with them, so them watching you drive wasn't really a surprise or anything but were they like yeah like this is cool maybe yeah. one day or is it just like hey shane you've done so much for us anytime you want to come <laughs> rip a skid we're happy for you to come down after hours and, and tear it up but that's that's the extent of it um yeah it's very a lot of what they've said is like oh no one else can drive it but you because we we like you and we trust you if that makes sense. That's yeah. probably um, from the experience on 
uh, from what they've the things that they've posted and things that they've seen posted by other groups. Yeah, ig- yeah, exactly. Um, because because I've been so positive and respectful and all that kind of stuff. Um, I guess they really did take a chance when they let me drive the go kart track like all those years ago. Um, because I took them all for passenger laps back then. And so they all got to experience what it was like in a drift car. So they all know what it's like to go drifting. Um, but I know a lot of people after they sit in my car and watch me drive, they're so shocked at how they're, they're very shocked at my driving style of how chill it is, I guess. Yeah. So their experience of drifting is from my me what i've shown them i guess okay so they wouldn't really know what it's like to be in a drift car with nick or or yourself you know yeah so i so i guess they trust my driving they know i can drive well so they're not concerned like even when i went out there they're like don't go on the grass because it's literally only just started to like key itself into the ground yeah you know, and like seeing it, like they've only put, they only put like one strip of um, grass around the edge, and it was looking very, very green and very lush and nice and stuff. But like, if I'm pretty sure, if I dropped a wheel onto it, I would have, you know, ripped a few few pads off the off the ground and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, obviously, they're trying to get the grass to key in so it will grow itself. So, um, you know, I know how to drive and keep it on the track, whereas yep. everyone else, not saying that I'm better than anyone else, but like I know how to drive to the level to not go too hard and that kind of thing. Whereas yeah. if other people go off, they they don't trust them or they don't have the their experience, their previous experience that I've spent years with. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, they're not, so, they're, yeah. As, they're not as comfortable. And I could understand that because watching other people drive, uh, even when they think they, they've, they like, barely come off, but they've, like, been massively off for mm. more than, yeah, they think, they believe anyway. Yeah, exactly. And if you throw 20-odd cars onto the track, like, you guaranteed to at least get someone to touch the grass every lap. Yeah. So eventually it will, it will possibly damage those edges. I think they're wanting and they like, they know that, you know, that's part of racing that people will come off and stuff, but they, they want to basically remove the, the sketchy drivers, the, the people that would that would come off and you know stick their throttle into it and not respect the track enough. Yeah, but in that regard. Yeah, they, but they, you know, again, it's yeah. Yeah, how do you sort of manage that? Because like Eastern Creek or Sydney Motorsport Park, they tried to have that licensing system. I think it was like a level one or level two thing, and then yeah, it's meant yeah. to be vetted and things like that. And they tried to make it fair, but like. How, even when you do that sort of thing, like if you try to do something similar to uh, to Ludnam, then um, I think you're just going to find like who's actually going to vet them, and um, if they do get allowed on, then other people will say it's just because they're friends or whatever. But it's yeah, I don't know how you would manage that type of thing without upsetting someone, and then ultimately something other negative negativity being created yeah and that's that's the like i've spoken to them about that as well like i have and said to them like i have no idea how you would be able to manage it yourselves like i guess we could like the people that i choose could vet the drivers that they allow on because obviously for the first few events i'm going to handpick everyone by their driving ability mostly on like how much I trust that they can keep it on off the grass and, but still like, you know, 
show them what drifting is and not half like casual drifting if that makes sense but long term like yeah I, I don't know how like someone fresh into the sport just got themselves a car is going to be able to get onto Ludnam easily yeah, like especially... by by their own ability and no relationship with anyone you know there was so that just, yeah talk about the a skid pan type area being created as well um, yeah it, so i yeah is that going to go ahead and will that be like a level one thing no <laughs> um so yeah because i'd mentioned oh maybe you should like you should do a skid pan or whatever you know because it will double as like overflow parking and you'll just you know give an, an extra area for people to drive on um because you, you can't go wrong with having a skid pan at the track. Like, it just means you can you can run more events because you, all of a sudden you can open it up to the Motocana guys and all that kind of... all those kinds of events and, like, begin, yep. beginner drifters as well. So you can run the whole way through of beginners onto, you know, onto the main track. Because yep. um, I'd mentioned that and then Simo... Or I presume it was Simo made the post about like, yeah, we're not allowing drifting yet, which the key word was yet, but everyone just said no drift, saw the no drifting and didn't see the yet, which I just was dumbfounded by. Um, but yeah, they also mentioned the skid pan and just kind of wrote it off as like we don't need another skid pan, and it's like. Because they were trying to like you know extend an olive branch to us yeah. and say like we, we'll we'll give you something like you know in the meantime, but then everyone just wrote it off and then after that they said no nah, we're not going to even bother with the skid pan like f them you know yeah okay that makes just sense. because of that's that's because of the reaction that they got from you know them trying to like be supportive of drifters and give them something at least. Um, they just wrote it off. And also because the, my idea of a skid pan is like Iron Park skid pan, not Eastern Creek skid pan, if that makes sense. So yeah, okay. like a long, long hundred plus meters, st- like straight bit of concrete into yeah. a, like a bit of a pad. Yeah. And use like, let us use, use that rather than the main circuit until you're happy with us using that. And then, you know, we can migrate over. Um, so you'd still get your, you know, third gear entries into a, into a, you know, an actual little fun circuit to, to drive on. Um, but, you know, obviously that kind of gets lost in translation on a Facebook post of a skid pan. Like it is a skid pan, but it's a skid pan with a, Hundred meter straight bit on the end. Yeah, yeah. I it's remember more like an, un- lots of... an undefined circuit. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a yeah. customizable it's a lollipop. circuit. Yeah, yeah. A lollipop yeah. track or whatever. Yeah, yeah similar to short course. So short yeah, course like in Queensland, a... that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Because I I learned how to mungee on like the skid pan at Oran Park because it was so long. You just go down and go side to side to side and then there was a big round bit at the end and you go around the round bit and just go side to side to side back and you know it was fun so why not build that again yeah I, well, I guess not anymore point, <laughs> yeah, yeah not anymore because everyone just hated it oh well, I did I sort guess... of have arguments with people about that but not yeah. on their post probably should have been on the post, like arguing against those people. They're being negative, but oh, it's too late now. They just oh, yeah, and that's half the problem with Facebook is like you don't see the whole conversation. You just see the original post, and then people just flame, flame, and yeah. you know, not really read the discussion or the development of the discussion. They just see a post and re- react and post their reaction. Yeah, but I guess going back to the point about upsetting people, if, you know, it sort of ends up private events similar to 
Port Macquarie's first event and events like that, I don't think it's necessarily such a bad thing because why should people miss out because we're worried about or people are worried about upsetting others. Like at the end of the day, uh, people have got, you know, they've got their cars. They want to go out and drive. If they've got the ability to go and do it, there should be no reason. Like I don't see any reason that you shouldn't, you know, you want to go skid this weekend and Simo's happy for you to show up out there and let you drive. Like you shouldn't not go and drive because, oh, I'm one and there are a couple of hundred people who miss out on this. Like that's crap. Like at the end of the day, you've been given the privilege to go and enjoy it for what it is. Like don't stop because of it. Uh, and I think potentially moving forward, that's where it sort of needs to go. And if, if you do want to get invited to those events or get involved in those events, then you need to be showing up to, to other events that are more open, get to know guys, prove to them and, and jump on trains and all that sort of stuff and learn how to drive with those guys. And then you'll find yourself being invited to those sort of events um, it'll happen more organically as long as, you know, there are stepping stone places like, you know, you can show up to a QR Mansuri and you don't have to have any experience or you can show up to a figure eight night and, you know, maybe a few guys will be just hanging for a skid and go out there and have a drive there once in a while. And you sort of get to know people uh, and, and build that community base, like you said, that had that feel out of Oran Park rather than now where it's all a little bit more segregated. Yeah, it's... But I don't. I I definitely don't want to be in the position where people are trying to line up what event they go to based on if I'm going there or someone that is vetting people for drifting at another event is going to. You know, like I would, again, you'd want people to be able to just free go to whatever event they want and and that be it. Um, I guess the like the invite only kind of stuff is I don't see it as like what's wrong with Australian drifting or whatever is having invite only stuff. I think it's more like it's people realizing how precious track time is and they want to protect their event and the future possibility of their event. So obviously they're going to invite people that they trust or like or have some at least knowledge of so that you know they you know it's like a birthday party you you only want your your friends and your mates to come to your birthday party to have fun with you don't want to invite you know you don't want it to be an open house so to speak because if you have an open house the cops will rock up and then you'll never be able to have a party again that'll be the same. I guess it's the same same kind of idea because track time is so precious in New South Wales to an extent. So I can see where the invite-only stuff is for and I don't think it's a bad thing. But again, it's I guess it's still difficult for, you know, the new guy to get into the event from that you know from his beginning stage he you know he'd have to go to wakefield and hope that well, even, guys Wake, even getting into wakefield at the moment is is pretty is, difficult so yeah I, I i guess at this stage while there are still a few open doors like you figure eight where uh, the other week uh jai myself um grant uh from up in Newcastle all showed up to the same one we didn't I knew Jai was potentially coming up when I went out I was just going out to test my car and he's like oh if you're going out I'll come out um and then Grant rocked up because he just decided oh I want to go skid and he had no idea we were showing up um and then you know everybody sort of got into those two guys because I think I only lasted two laps anyway um but those guys ended up doing a bunch of driving together but they're the sort of nights where you start to get to know a few of the locals if those guys sort of get involved and like, oh, I've seen you driving. Can I jump on with you guys or whatever? And I guess that's how I got to know a lot of guys, but I guess I've come from a, a fairly social background with sport. So you sort of get used to doing that where a lot of guys are a bit more sheltered from all of that. But all you guys sort of started from the same place. And I think people just need to start doing more of that and not sticking to their little clicks and actually getting involved and, and having chats to, to everybody else. Um, kind, but yeah, kind of like with me, I think I would, if I, if someone impressed me with their driving, 
I would go talk to them and say, hey, you're driving cool. Um, I really like that you do this, 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 this. And then, um, and then what, and then we'll see if I, I might actually drive with them rather than them asking to drive with me. Cause I'm still a bit uneasy if someone, I don't know, sort of comes up and says, Hey, can I drive with you? And then it's like, Oh, I don't really know you. So I kind of want to watch you mm. first kind of thing. Um, that's, that's like would be more comfortable. Yeah. I think introducing yourself would probably be the, the first thing if you want to get to know someone or um, and but, yeah, I, but I think I don't know. It's just getting yeah. in, just getting actually getting involved though, getting to know people, doing all that again, just yeah. not sticking to your your, your click really it will broaden your horizons. You know, yeah, cliche yeah. to say, but it really, it really does. And and at that stage, if you're that open-minded to do that, you will start to to look at other people's driving, look at yourself as a driver and what you can do, and and all that sort of flows naturally behind it, as opposed to somebody who's a little bit more closed off and sheltered to everything. Um, they either are super convinced I, that they're really shit or super convinced that they're really good. Yeah, so, I think they just need to be open-minded, uh, and usually you can tell like the way they drive, uh, and the attitude, and sort of like the group. So you'll see. Like close off people, they'll be like very tight in a group. Where open people will be like looking around and saying hello, and like you can you can really get the vibe. Like people that are very open, they're like you might be scared approaching them, but you can kind of you get the vibe that yeah, it's cool. Like I can you know sort of say hello, and they won't sort of punch you in the face or something like that. Yeah, like I've usually made friends with whoever's pitted next to me, oh, if okay. that makes sense. Yeah, like. Um, just because you're next to each other, you start sharing tools or just say, oh, how's it going out there? And that, like, I've, like, the friends that I've made have been through, like, drift school, you know, because you have to drive with, with them anyway. Um, so you just try to get, you, you just naturally get to know them anyway because you're driving next, like, with one another constantly. So you have something to, you like have that moment to talk about and share and and stuff like that and i'm regularly like telling people to drive better at drift school and take a different line and stuff like that and they've all seemed very receptive of that and positive and like i remember um like when isaac Get was just starting to drive out there like he was very rough but by the end of the day he was being a lot more consistent and then I'd started driving driving with him and giving him pointers on like hey on this corner just try and be wider so that I can jump into the pocket with you and and that kind of thing um so yeah I guess it just does come round down to like just being able to drive with with people and being confident with one another and just being being able to talk to talk to other drivers out there it's almost to the point where you don't want a big like posse you're like you don't want your own big posse to come out and watch you drift because you'll come in and they'll all just say oh that was sick mate yeah that was awesome and you know they'll all just like lift you up on a pe- on a pedestal or whatever and and then you'll end up just not meeting anyone, possibly not meeting anyone that way, or you'll just, you know, stick with the one mate who invited you out and you'll just drive with him and you'll never expand your horizons, which is not a bad thing, but I guess if you want to, it's it's not bad to expand your friendship circles in drifting. I mean, that's like half of it, right, is the social side and feeling connected to something more so than just oh I like drifting and I just go drifting and then go home it's like the social side is a lot bigger aspect and I think especially yeah. in New South Wales like there the community is so jagged because it's the people that go to high tech and the people that don't go to high tech or it's the people that go, do comps and don't do comps you know like you you do see a lot of like comp guys stick stick with comp guys and that kind of thing and then yeah you don't end up there's never any points when the freestyle side gels or mixes with the other side you know like i think 
the first or second bring the bash that we did was like the first time when I'd driven with Bo Yates in like four, like, you know, four, five, six years or whatever. Like it had been that long since I'd driven with him last just because Bo is so, like solidly comp based. And, and I'm very solidly, I'm just going out for fun and having good times with my mate mates and getting better at driving, you know? So there is that very, like, two two sides of it. So you're never going to blend very well. And, you know, that's what you see on Facebook these days. I think but having, it, yeah. But in fairness with, with that, though, guys like Bo have started popping up more and more out at regular track nights, just sort of just hanging out or just, uh, swinging past an event just to, to see how things are going to try and mentor and do all that a little bit more. Uh, mm, I, think yeah. it, I think I think we're starting to talk more about you guys sort of in that mid-range mid range area. But re- like reality is there's not a huge amount of those guys in, in New South Wales. And I guess there's not enough track events uh, or big track events to, to draw out that many people. There's so many regular uh, figure eight nights that, you know, you're occasionally run a run into a few guys uh, who are competing or have previously competed on a figure eight night, but most guys are sort of either traveling interstate or waiting for your bigger Wakefield events and all that, to, or bash events to happen. Um, yeah. Back to your... Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't drive figure eight or the, the wet pen really. And haven't for, I think since like world time attack, like a few years ago when I tried to, you know, get stuff happening through high tech. Um, yeah. I haven't driven it since. Because it's just such a, I don't like it. It's so bouncy and jaggering and jarring to be out there, and I'm never, I never feel comfortable because of, there's always like the bumps everywhere. So you'll initiate, and especially when the walls came in, I was like, hell no, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not on a big budget, so I can't really afford to keep smashing quarters and all that kind of stuff regularly. Yeah. I can't afford I can't afford that risk and I don't want to do that if that makes sense. Yeah. Like of I'm course. sure I'd be able to drift it and still drift it well, but I'm not going to be running the wall and I'm going to be, you know, sticking to the inside line a lot more than I used to just because of that that risk versus I still want to have a cool drift car at the end of the day and I want to not break the budget my budget because it's you know it's only going to get tighter as i get older yeah and i guess and in fairness it's that's basically how everybody's drifting should be you've got a means and you've got to work out what your end goal is and what you actually want out of it and that's how you should be driving not to a social expectation but to the expectation Mm -hmm. that you put on yourself and i think that's also where some of the big issues come. Um, if I listened to a social expectation, I'd have a 1J in my car and it would be purple with a, <laughs> with a, you know, a carbon silver bonnet. Um, and, and chrome gray lights. Yeah. So <laughs> not chrome uh, fluoro, sorry. Fluoro. fluoro no, he's, got, thing. he's got full of fluoro. Gen, he's got genuine roses that are fluoro. Yeah. Genuine ones. Genuine rotors. Yeah. Did you yeah. say genuine rotors? Yeah. Yeah. In my uh, in in my British paints, uh, fluoro yellow. <laughs> so, and I guess back, back, back to your other point on the uh, um on the the whole like bringing out your own posse. I think so people don't misinterpret what you more mean is not is non drift people as opposed to to surrounding yourself with. You might have a big posse that comes out of dudes who you've met through driving or who do drive that aren't driving that day and have come out to support you. But I think you're, you're talking, uh, you know, your schoolmates who have watched one dude do a skid after, after school down the, down the street or whatever, and are now, uh, full blown drift experts. And you you know, you bring 20 guys out. So you've got no time to actually socialize and meet anybody as opposed to coming out with, you know, maybe one mate who helps you change tires and load and unload the car and then actually getting to know a whole bunch of people when you don't have the right tools or you need a spare or something like that. Yeah. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Like you, you can, and like it would be, you know, if you've got a solid friendship circle around you that's supportive, like I wouldn't say, oh, don't come, otherwise I no, won't no, get I, any I, drift friends. But like, yeah, like 
I'm just repeating what I kind of said. It kind of that's how it sounds like it's a bad yeah. thing to bring your mates to no, 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 events. Of but yeah, yeah, no, nah, it, I, no, no, I just more mean like yeah, it's it's not that that bad side of it. But when you're when you're trying to get yourself involved in the community, you you sort of dive into the community if you bring too much of your own circles in. Of course, once like every so often, bring your mates out. Of course, like it's it, it's great and sort of gives people an understanding of what you're actually doing, but you know, also take the time from the other side to, to get to know your, your neighbors in the pits or um, the dude that you're on track with or before you jump on their door or whatever, rather than, yeah, thinking that, you know, I, I'm great, I can do this, but if you want more out of it, then, you know, keep changing the way you're sort of approaching so you can find a way to get more out of it, uh, I think is sort yeah. of along the lines of what you meant. Yeah, it's, um, it's very... It feels very rushed, like the figure eight and the wet pans, just of how it's like um, set up. I guess it's it's good wet pan wise because you get forced into all standing around with all the other drivers, so you do get to meet a lot of the other drivers that way. Because I actually met met Adam Burgess that way was going out to a wet pan night, um, and just seeing. Yeah, seeing him there and he was learning to drift back then and, like, he had a few mates around him, but they were obviously, they were all very open-minded and very, like, socially, like, not closed in and all that and took a whole bunch of them for rides and whatnot and, like, it's a good way to meet friends was in that lineup for the wet pan, but then on the... On like the figure eight one, everyone was sitting in cars just waiting to inch forward slightly, you know. Um, yeah, so I... it, yeah, many events get, especially when, like, say for the, like for the bash for the last bash, everyone was sitting in a queue for the entire day, so you barely get to talk to anyone except for lunch. Yeah, so you can't really. Yeah, it's very, I found it very kind of isolating, even though, like, oh, I can see my mate Joey, he's six cars back, or I can see Matt, he's two cars ahead. Because you're constantly shifting and moving cars up, it's very difficult to get out, chat about the last run that you did, and, you know, get ready for the next one without having to run back to your car every two or three minutes to shift, move it up a few spots. So it's, I, like that's another reason why I'm a bit against the whole like one lap, one long wait kind of. Yeah, format. Yeah, I hate that format. I really do. Yeah, you'd rather blow a set of tires off the car and then go and hang out for a while. Yeah. Just do do because I really liked the start and the end of the bash because I was like first guy on and last guy off being the first one out because no one had like gotten their act together and they were slow, slow with getting organized that by the time that everyone started filtering out, yeah, I'd already had four runs pretty much back to back. And so I had already kind of understood the, the layout and the line that I needed to take. And the rest was trying without much success to find someone to, tandem with that didn't spin in front of me or scare the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a, yeah. Yeah. It was also hard to get organized with people that you actually wanted to drive with because the track oh, was narrow and two lines of people was, yeah. Yeah. Cause I'd try and orchestrate it so that I'd actually be in a group with like my, you know, mate, Matt or trying to line up with Joey and then all of a sudden the group ahead of you will only go with five cars instead of the six, and then all of a sudden one of us has dropped out of the next bracket, and so we were instantly separated and and that kind of thing. And I found myself regularly just diving through the infield after the first corner just because I've seen the group that I'm with and know that I'd rather jump ahead because, you know, like half the time you'd end up in that group again, half the time. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it basically came down to trying to maximize the good quality time with, you know, yeah, the the bad bad runs. You didn't want to end up in a bad group. And that's why I hate the whole single lap 
or yeah, that kind of whole thing. I just want to do solid runs, and that's how you learn is by doing lap after lap, you know. So, like, what sport did you do at the Olympics? I can't remember. Oh, I skated. Yeah, you skated. So, like, you didn't go and skate for 30 seconds, get off the ice, no. chill out on the side. You were An on hour the and ice. Half at a time, yeah, kicking yeah. your own ass, yeah. Exactly. So you you get that time, whereas on drifting with the whole one lap, one long wait you you know you're learn you're driving for a minute not even a minute like 40 seconds and if then you're lucky you, on a track <laughs> yeah well i think lee um from driving sports had timed the south circuit days as you're driving for a minute when we're doing turns four to 12 you're driving for a minute and then you'd come back and wait 10 to 15 minutes for your next run yeah you definitely can't build muscle memory or anything off something that's that. Yeah, you can't that's sporadic. You can't get a rhythm. You can't kind of feel the flow. Your car gets either starts to overheat because you're not moving and you're stuck behind six other hot cars, or your tires get cold again. So when you go out, you understeer and spin on the first turn and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, not a fan. Yeah, it's probably okay on not okay on most situations, but if, if you get to drive somewhere special, say that, that doesn't open up very often, like, Hey, we get to do turn one at Eastern Creek or something crazy like that. Hey, that's not so bad. I'll sacrifice the fact that I only get to do, you know, one lap and then wait 15 minutes because it's saying special. But when you're, when you're talking small tracks that are, are fairly generic or whatever, you, you sort of hope that you can find a rhythm and find a flow and actually feel like you're improving rather than being like, Oh, I'm just happy. I finally got one clean lap in today or, um that sort of yeah. stuff yeah definitely like it's sacrifice like as if we get to drive a track i mean which is what it is in new south wales if we get to drive i mean you're willing to make sacrifices in the quality and the time of the track time like yeah if it was for half the time you'd still go because you never get to drive the place or you know that you know you make sacrifices yeah, just have to in New South Wales for what you get. Yeah, and you're not going to show up to a figure eight night and <clears throat> hope that you get, a, you know, three laps of the track in an hour and a half or something like that. Like, nobody's going to show up to that sort of thing. Yeah, um, exactly. Like, if you start kind of trying to work out how much time you're actually going to get, you don't want to, you know... Especially for me, like, I can only afford to go drifting so often, and if... Like, the event is looking like it's not worth the time. Like, because for a while with the bash, when the schedule got changed and we we're going to get mixed in with the motorbikes and have less time up there, I was seriously considering bowing out because I didn't want to drive all the way to port and miss hanging out with my cute little loud kid, you know, to drive for like a few hours when I could just kind of go to the drift school the next week, drive literally all day and still have fun, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, to, to only get, and I think it was going to end up being like three or four sessions with, with 60 cars, you're probably looking at, the reality was people were probably going to get maybe a grand total of maybe 20 laps in the day. Um, yeah, and that's yeah, not when you when you when you add in all your other your extras on top of that, um, your extra nights accommodation to be up there before you travel, <coughs> the, just the amount of hours you're on the road, all that sort of stuff. It just the the fun per lap, and this is where a lot of people's arguments is over some of the comps and all that is like your your fun per lap and dollar per lap ends up just blowing out so far that it's really not worth it. Like each lap mm. has actually cost you several hours of, of time to do that one lap, even though that lap is 40 seconds, 30 seconds. And then it's also cost you several hundred dollars just to do that one lap. So, um, yeah. if and then you end up just... straightening and then losing or yeah. your glove falls out. I mean, yeah. you lose out to monk house. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just, yeah, it's really not, <laughs> It really isn't worth it. And I think that's where, uh, when people argue about it, it's yeah, people have to understand that's what a lot I of people think are Greg actually... got that. 
No, no I, I, I guessing, doubt he would have. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing it's an ADGP uh, no. uh, no. reference or... No. You, you had to be there, mate. Yeah. Where, yeah. where did you where, where did you lose, mate? <laughs> you you tell him the story, EG. You no, you have no. a lot more. No, you don't want it. No. Or was it EG no. who lost? No, yeah, I lost. And yeah, because he's because um. You know, I had to have a G one. Yeah. Yeah, because at G one we needed to like Sunaga was very adamant like we're pro comp so wear gloves and because Australia still hasn't realised or hasn't like gotten that fact is hey gloves like i saw a video of the high-tech comp on the weekend and the dude was like full race suit and he's like little white hands were on the steering wheel and it was just like oh that looks so unprofessional and um yeah sanaga was like you gotta wear gloves and so everyone's trying to find gloves so everyone's going to um oh what's the shop called the seven uh, power Kamori. whatever like yeah power Kamori and yeah. those shops trying to like find any kind of gloves and people are wearing like welding gloves on the track and you know just to like pass the naga's rule and and the glove that eg had wasn't his normal gloves and the glove like fell off when he was, was on manami i think after that is when i actually bought the team orange gloves yeah yeah, yeah, a like, few people dumb. are buying those gloves. Yeah, yeah. But, is, but is this EG's story as to why he was shit? No, it actually, it was his... like I slipped off. Like yeah. I went to grab the wheel and I grabbed just glove. Only but is it is it is there video or anything of this or like you know? Oh, uh, somewhere. There probably will be. There probably would be. Yeah. Um, it would be. I'd... Yeah, it's a long time ago. Two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve. But. Yeah. But if somebody yeah, like yourself was doing a commentary video, you'd probably just be making reference to how shit you were. So let's just say yeah, that was not really the gloves. Dumb. Yeah, no, let's just say fault. it's not the gloves' fault. You're just shit. Because I, yeah, that was my that was my fault. I could have managed that, but I didn't. So it was irritating. Your other run was solid, but then yeah, the other run you screwed up, and then because your glove fell off, and then Monkhaus kept going, and you yeah. got eliminated. Yeah. And you came in, and like the first line you said is like, "I should have beat Monkhouse." And for the rest of the time we we're over there, every now and again, you'd be like, "I should have beat Monkhouse." That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Yeah, it was great annoying. time. Yeah. Yeah. That's Sorry good, to yeah. like make you Open- relive that. <laughs> yeah, opening old wounds. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, now I always buy. If I don't have the Team Orange gloves, I've went and bought proper racing gloves. Just pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. I bought I bought cheapo um, motocross bike gloves. Because I didn't like racing gloves because they were just too thick. And I've got like little skinny hands. And so I just found the gloves that worked and they didn't complain. So. Okay. Yeah, I hate, I hate wearing like, gloves. So yeah. I don't wear I, them. I've, I think. Once we it. got told, yeah, after we got told we needed to wear gloves for G1, I haven't not worn gloves since. Yeah, fair enough. I just I wore, committed. Yeah, I wore mine for, for high tech, and then every other time that I don't have to wear them, I wouldn't wear them. Yeah. You, it'll actually, it actually affects your driving if you aren't used to them and you have to wear them. Yeah. yeah. So it's, right, it's better to just get used to wearing them because if you want to be pro... You're gonna have to wear gloves eventually, so you might as well just wear gloves now and and be, you know, yeah, just commit, mate. Yeah, I don't, should just wear my mechanic. I should just wear yeah. the mechanic ones anyway because I spend more time trying to fix the car <laughs> off. So I should just, I should just sort of, yeah. I should wear coveralls and mechanic gloves and just sort of accept the fact that at some stage I'm gonna have to go back in the pits and try and work out how to fix my shit. Yeah, don't need a race suit. Just wear some Japanese overalls and. You know, put some logos on it and you're set. Yeah. Well, uh, basically what I need with the amount of shit that I've been doing lately, so. <laughs> oh, you you feel like you've done a lot of work, Greg. <laughs> <Great. laughs> well, I, I, well, I spent a lot of time last in the last 12 months or 18 months towing a car around the country <laughs> and then loading it back onto a trailer broken, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but I put a motor in by myself for the first time ever over the weekend, and it runs. Wow. Yeah, nice. I haven't 
touched my motor since 2011. <laughs> so at the moment, Greg's got his finger off at the, the only The only thing I've ever broken in my car was the standard SR gearbox because I had stripped it on um, North Circuit just under full power. I just stripped all the gears off wow. and then I put an R33 box in it and it's been fine since. Well, hopefully I'm heading to a more reliable times again, so... Yeah. What turbo have you got? Uh, G25 550. So just downgrade it and you'll be reliable? No, no, no. no it's that, just that, run. Is the, oh. that is the downgrade. That is oh, the really? downgrade. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was on a 3076. Oh, so, wow. But I'm dropping it down to 16 pound. It's a standard motor. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, should that's be all, okay. That's all you need, eh? Like, like it goes back to the drift drift bible you know i'd still base everything that i do off that is balance and that's why i'm getting the drop knuckles for the front so i get balance again um yeah it's all balance and you don't need that much power because i'm not running 265 semis even though i have regularly run 265 semis all round and like love it because it's just so crazy and fast but it's way not financially um I can't viable. do it consistently. Yeah. yeah, it's not viable. Yeah, but I'd I'd love to be able to do that because it's ma- just so much faster and so much more fun. Maybe we need no. to do a Shane's drift bible. <sighs> I think that's Shane, a good grip, idea. Big grip, big grip, low power. Yeah, but I but I think a lot of people don't know how. Like even for me, I sort of started chasing power after totally cooking my clutch and all that on South Circuit uh, high tech round only running two, three, five semis, but I was just trying to clutch kick the fuck out of it the whole way up the hill, trying to, trying to get to wheel spin. But that's, you know, no, like, you know, all the heart in the world, but no idea on how to actually get it to, to keep going. Um, And I think that's where a lot of people, the easy solution to that is get a, a clutch that won't slip so you put a, a stronger box behind it and then you give it a shitload more power and then you just do a big rolling burnout up the hill and you don't have to worry about the driving technique side of things because it's the quicker way to get there um but it's not necessarily the you know it's definitely not the best way to get there and then you've got all the problems that come with that and the big financial problems that come with that where a lot of people don't i guess back to the point of the lack of track time in new south wales is how do you learn to drive that like i wouldn't imagine driving your car on 265 semis in the rear like i did it when my car was on like 280 kilowatt and i thought i was going to lift the front of the car up and end up you know in the dump on the other side of eastern creek because of you know just how quickly it hooked up but then i went and drove a faster track and i felt like i didn't have enough power to sort of break that traction but that was probably me with my asshole clenched really tight and and no guts to actually really throw it in properly yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting when driving sports do their their North Circuit Day in December because it's like they're going to have pretty high entrant numbers. I think like 80 or something like that yeah. are going to be their target. So you're going to have 80 cars for the circuit, which sounds a lot, but how like they're running it as like a full open, like um, keep going around circuit, which is what, you know exactly what i want so everyone's going to get a lot of solid time and it'll be very interesting seeing everyone's driving because majority of drivers in new south wales haven't seen past second gear <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, 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 and honestly it's like anybody who listens to this and and thinks that shane's poking fun like it, <laughs> reality is it, 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 but it, but, Stabbing but, everyone. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. But, but but it's not a, it's not a stab. It, it, it's true. Like you're every a lot of people, the majority are inexperienced. Like it, it's just yeah. The, well, it's the like fl- it's the same with me. I haven't been out of like third gear. I've been in third gear probably a total of like five minutes max this year. Yeah, but I th- but <laughs> I think that but people think like these sort of conversations are, are poking fun at. A specific group or or specific mm. people or, or putting people down it's like it's like no you're gonna suck at it when you first try and do it it's just part of learning and 
but accept the fact that you are going to suck at it. And when you suck at it, try and, you know, take everything that you do as a learning experience and then you get better at it, you know, as you go rather than thinking that first lap out, you're going to be some some hero and, and be able to do it. And, you know, some people go out there and, and be a hero and do it first go, but there's a good chance that they've got experience in something else that's given them that feel to be able to do it or they're fluked at one run and the next run, you know, they're barrel rolling through one of the corners. Uh, yeah, so, it's, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's not going to be like a every, like I'm sure there's going to be people that just are going to struggle with the high speed of it. Cause it's really going to be a high speed event. Whereas like we haven't had a high speed event since the last, like I, I guess if you go to Wakefield and they let us do the long course, that's probably pretty fast. But not um, continuous fast like that, though. Yeah, it's a different like, especially when you start pushing fourth gear. Like I guess some people are doing that down the straight at Wakey, fourth gear into the first corner, so they would be a bit more comfortable and know what to expect. But if like say the people that have only ever done like bring the bash level events going to fourth gear is going to be a big step like because everything changes when you start going faster it's actually easier when you go fast the faster you go it's actually a lot easier to drift if that makes sense or what i found yeah but then it's yeah trying to get your brain to override what what your body's telling you to do um the first time i ever i guess one of the only times i've ever done fourth is uh turn one at, at QR and the only reason I actually had the guts to do it was because Tiana Fink was like told me the day before I went out there she's like basically you're a pussy if you don't grab fourth and I'm like well if if you know if she's comfortable enough to, to say just go hit it in fourth and it's safe to do you just go hit it in fourth and it feels safe to do um, because somebody else has shared that experience on to say you know it's it's good to go like don't don't stress about it it'll it'll work um, yeah. so and I think, and that's, you know, one of the the other big things with, with learning to, to do the driving is listening to those experiences and trying to override your own feelings sometimes on things and, and listening to the, to, to the good advice you've been given from guys who actually know what they're doing um, and, and just trusting it and giving it a go rather than sort of staying in that safe zone the whole time. Yeah, well, I'm sure, like, by the end of the event, everyone's going to be going, like, ten times faster and be so much more confident at going at speed um, that everyone's probably going to, like, get addicted to it again and want just fast circuit days because for a while, a lot of people were like, I just want to go fast. I want to be in fourth gear. I don't want to be in second gear. I want to be in fourth. And then the events disappeared and you're like, I'm not driving anymore because I can't be in fourth. And it's like, well, see ya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, like, like yeah. Yeah. I know, yeah I've, heard, I've heard of those people as well. Yeah. Those people just being very generic and vague. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Times. All right. So anything else you sort of want to, you want to share or I'm sure you'll be somebody that will probably sort of pop up again at, uh, in the future considering um you are you know you've you've had a lot of experience in the sport and you've you've seen and done a lot of things that a lot of people haven't done uh, and you've been around long enough to, to have seen a lot of changes i've uh, been around sort of... long enough to see Oren park that's, that's <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah so i've seen shit like <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 we'll and we'll try and get you to be less politically politically correct as uh as we get oh, you on i'm, sh I'm, I'm sure. sure someone's gonna not like me anymore after this <laughs> I, I, I i don't think there's yeah. anything that was said that um that isn't no, Look, I'm if sure you can't, someone will it's, find a way yeah, yeah. To, oh it's to like twist that's, and contort the that's words the, into the world events. that's the world that we're in now like everyone like can't deal with an opinion and get salty and then just hates them for the rest of their life even though like i'll have i'll never know that they hate me like the amount of times <laughs> people have like oh but shane hates me and i'm like what like the fuck are oh, you i thought you were i thought you're pretty cool and i would have said hey if you ever said hey but you never did so <laughs> you know like 
all these people, like, I'm sure there's people out there that just don't talk to me. Like, there's heaps of people that I know and have talked to and then been friends with and then all of a sudden just not been friends with. And so, I'm, you know, I'm sure people are getting salty about whatever I've said. But, you know, if you knew me, which most of them probably don't because they just, you know, go to comps and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like no. uh, now I see why you and EG are friends. <laughs> yeah, because well, I remember we used to sit on the infield at Wakefield together and just judge people. Yeah, yeah, we did that. That, that was what we did, yeah. and then I ended up judging people at high tech, and yeah, some people didn't like that. Do you feel dirty now? <laughs> I has, no has it washed I, off. I, how many shower, How many cold showers have you taken? I I don't feel dirty about like trying to do things with high tech because it just comes back to me wanting to try and get something to happen for the community because at the time it was looking a bit bleak and George comes in with high tech with a bit of money backing so I'm basically. I the, my aim was basically to get events happening again through George because he had the money, he had the backing with Eastern Creek to get events. And from the beginning, I'd basically said, you need practice, like we need practice days, otherwise your series is going to be dead in two years with because you'll only have the same five, ten drivers driving. And like that's what happened for ages is... You know, you only had the same five guys on the podium over and over again. You didn't have any fresh blood because you didn't have any practice days to feed feed it. And then we started getting the, the drift for real days on the Friday, which is a step in the right direction. But it's like how many years has it been running and it's only just started happening. Yeah. Um, I, I tried. I did what I could. I tried to run different layouts on the figure eight because I could not stand having to watch an entire series on repeat every round, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah you can go watch Sprint Car for the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's just round and round and round, and that's what the comp was back then. It's good that it's on different tracks now because it you know, gives that variety on every event, whereas at the figure eight it was the same event repeated five times. And I wanted to do different layouts and I'd say, oh, yeah, do this layout. And we'd like me and EG actually tried tried a few layouts at the high tech event and they were really fun. But they were, you know, good. But then cams wouldn't allow it because George was going through cams for the comp at that time because it was a crossover and you're not supposed to do crossovers in motorsport. Um, because it's a danger and all that. Um, and they'd put in the directional ripple strips, which is just stupid. Yeah. Uh, that was really yeah. dumb. Yeah, it was really dumb. So basically I just, I'd just i given up because it wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't getting anywhere with anything that I was saying. And like I was head judge of the comp series and I was constantly trying to want to try new things but i wasn't getting anywhere so it's like i'm not yeah, wasting waste energy yeah yeah and that was when i was still on the cams board as well and it basically all gotten to a point where i was just like no nah, screw it i'm i'm over trying to get things happening better for new south wales i'm just going to go drive when i can and just enjoy myself again and that's what i did yeah and that's yeah. what you can really do a lot yeah. of people um uh, not- don't appreciate the work that you you did and they don't understand it. They, they just never hear it. Oh, they don't know. And then they think it's easy. You just pay money. But yeah, there's a lot of other hurdles yeah. that people don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've I've tried many things and thanks for the encouragement. Um, I gave it a shot. I did what I could. Uh, I'm at the stage where I'm just driving for the fun. I just, you know, maximize my fun with the money that I've got. Yeah, but but your input isn't the people who know and value guys like you still continue to value like the fact that with no direct club involvement you were pulled into that New South Wales drift meeting that 
went on earlier in the year. Um, yeah. Just shows you that there are a lot of people, even within those clubs, that are, are so separate to each other that that respect the amount of work that you've done in the background and um, all that sort of stuff. And I think really that's where the value is because they're the guys who have been in it and are sort of stuck around the sport long term, where others have sort of floated in and yeah. out. Um, and sort of when it, when the, something cool comes up that that tweaks their interest, they come back in. But um, you know, if there's only a a good solid foundation of guys who actually have stuck through all the ups and the downs and all that. And I think all those guys still, you know, highly value you because you know, that, that still shows it from that, even yeah. if a lot of it has, has fallen to, to nothing, but I, I don't think mm-hmm. anything can ever fall to nothing because it's been experiences learned. Um, and I guess it sounds like even from, from speaking to you about all the London stuff that if you have your time again, which you may have your time again with, with getting to design a track. There's a whole lot of things that you've already learnt that you would do totally different, um, which would probably pull, you know, things into fruition a lot quicker than you know what we might be dealing with with Ludnam. So um, we just need yeah. uh, Bamford to win a shitload of money, and you can design his track for him. <laughs> yeah, like there, there's spots out there that I've got my, like I'm keeping a close watch on that I'm hoping will pop up and somehow become available um like the biggest thing as well like with trying to find a place is like i don't have the money at all to be able to actually Even follow start. through on any of these designs or applications <laughs> you know like as as much as it's like yeah i'm gonna do all this and i'm gonna get drift happening again but like ultimately i have no cash and i've never gotten to the point where i need I've needed cash yet, so that's still like the big, the big hurdle is like, I I'm fearful of like I'll get actually get somewhere and then they'll be asking for like a down payment of like thousands of dollars and I'll be like, uh yeah, just like give me a few weeks and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm still I'm, I haven't like given up searching completely, but I've definitely taken a more chill out back yeah i'm still looking yeah, but, again, but yeah. if anyone has lots of money and has a spot to drive or has lots of money at least i mean really all you need is money in new south wales and you get everything you need um but yeah if anyone out there in the <laughs> world wide web has cash and or a land to build something simple like i swear like a 200 mil, like a mil, like a 200 meter by 40 meter, like big pad or whatever would suffice. Yeah, there's like a car park drift. in Western. There's a car park in Western Sydney that would be great for that, but they don't allow it. Yeah, like there's so many places that are already built that would be perfect. Like even like spots at Wizard, like doing the return road. If we could get Wizard to start letting us drift the place, like would have our problem solved land wise, but we just need the money to build it and convince wizard to build it or, you know, you just need money. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> sounds like a little community group needs to start back up again, but away from the being underneath sort of something like a cams organization, but sort of trying to pull in guys who, have sort of skills in different areas that can actually genuinely make it happen. Like the fact that you're in the drafting sort of thing and then somebody who'd be in a marketing background, like the sport's so diverse that there would definitely be dudes in each sort of almost in each realm that you need to, to make everything happen. Uh, but it's sort of finding those guys and knowing what each other does, uh, you know, as a job that can sort of, and have the time to actually invest into it and something big can probably actually happen, but it's actually getting those, those good minds together um, that I think, you know, proves to be the most difficult part, but I'm sure eventually with the right attitude, it might, it might happen, but we've got our designer here. So if you, if you're in, if if you're a marketing expert and can help make some money, then Shane wants to have a chat with you. And if you're somebody who's a property mogul and you've got some land, Shane wants to speak to you as well. Yeah. We just need land that allows noisy things to happen. (laughs) So right next to Badgeries Creek. Yeah. If we could somehow buy out a go-kart track that doesn't have noise issues, 
then yeah, sweet. Not... If we could find a industrial lot that doesn't have noise issues, that we can zone to be motorsport related. Yeah, man, that's close to Sydney. You'll make easy money. Yeah, definitely. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. But long-term plans. Yep. Cool. Long-term. Right. Um, well, we're past two and a half hours, so probably time to shit. wrap this one up. This is probably, um, this is all close to the longest. It could be the longest. No, no, no. There's been ones longer, but by sure? this stage, I'm, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I think we've done. No one's going to watch ones. this. Uh, <laughs> people listen to it. Oh, yeah, really? yeah. We end yeah. up with a couple. Yeah, you end up with like, over a couple of hundred views on it. Mm. Um, once the once uh, live, you don't up. end up. Yeah, live. You know, we peak out normally in the twenties. Tonight's been quiet because all the cursed boys are at wizard uh, drag racing. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I'm hope some sure. of them actually drift the return road. That would be epic. I should have they messaged Jai and told him to actually do it. But uh, the last update I got, uh, Ristic uh, chopped him in their first race, and then he beat him in the se- Ristic beat him in the second race. But Jai's uh, time slip that I saw was like a 1.5 second reaction time. So I think he may have been uh, Snapchatting before he took off. Uh, so. <laughs> I think they were running 12. They ended up in the, the low 12s, I think. So that's wow. pretty good times for... That's pretty yeah. cool. Um, pretty good. Car. Yeah. Okay. Um, so is there cool. any one you need to plug? Plug yourself or... Sponsors? Or any, or any final statements? Um, I Be nice really on the any... internet to the, yeah. to the track owners. If you say you're what's wrong with drifting in australia you literally saying that is what's wrong with drifting in australia because it's like immediately prefacing that you're against something um just be supportive damn it like come on (laughs) yeah like just being aggro to each other you're gonna get like nowhere you end up just hating each other so if one of the guys has an event i mean you're not gonna go to it so you get less track time or whatever just be friend be what is oh, what is the line? Be excellent to one another. Ah uh, yes. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to the sequel. Oh uh, really? I'm surprised they're making it. Yeah, me too. I don't know if Greg um, knows what we're talking too, about. I have no idea. Yeah, uh, way too nerdy for me. It's not even. <laughs> it's not even that it's, old. It's, I mean, it's older than us. Like it's like uh, yeah. Anyway. I don't have any sponsors. <laughs> I need tires. Oh, I guess Just Jap. Just Jap's my sponsor. Illegitimate sponsor. Go to Just Jap. Right. Get cool stuff. Oh, you get helped out there? Yeah. Yeah, they're good they guys. They do. They look, yeah. they look after you. Even though I'm not, like, directly sponsored, it's I'm there all the time, chilling. Yeah, I've... Bought, um, a, bought a car off the other week, so... I've been helped out by them as well, so, they're, yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, they're good peeps. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, I didn't look. I've been watching the questions, as, uh, the comments. Sorry, um, but there's nothing really directly uh, question towards you except for Jake asking if you still share the car with your dad. Um, not so much now. Dad's kind of gotten a bit old. <laughs> Um, that he's not, yeah, he hasn't been driving as much now because he's been doing a lot of pit crew work for the Jesus Racing um, XYGT in the, I don't think it's Muscle Car Masters, it's one of the other, like, retro car series. So Dad's been very heavily involved with the, with that um, being pit crew for them. So I think he's up in um, Queensland at the moment. He's been to more tracks than I have, um, but he doesn't r- drive it that much. But he's he's still got the surfboard wing and he's still got his semi slicks out the back. Cool. How okay. do we get to this point in this conversation? We're talking about somebody with money, and your dad's tied up with with Fisher. Like, come on, like, there you go. It's all it's voluntary. Ah, just... oh, is it? Ah. 
Oh, volunteers. Oh, my gosh. Uh, How would I build my motor without volunteers? Oh. Uh, come on. You know, I'm, I'm sure if you get Fisher involved with the drifting, bigger things could happen. No, he's, he's got all his money invested in his cars. It's a Maybe. big operation. I mean... Yeah. yeah, but that's what I mean. So you, all he needs is a is a S13 in that stable and uh, convert him, mate. He was going to buy a 180 for a while, but he I don't think he ended up doing it because he crashed his car and so he needed to buy another XY GT shell to reshell it. So. Oh, after he smashed his ankles at Winton. <laughs> yep. Ah, fuck. Yeah, that wasn't a good one. Yeah, so Dad does that more so now. He still comes out to the event sometimes. He was up at Bash helping. So yeah, cool. that's it. And then Andrew Date's been saying how much he uh, how much he loves you. <laughs> I love him too. He's a good driver. He's faster than me on two one fives than I am on two three fives. So. Oh wow. Yeah. Cool. He's still in Japan, isn't he? I think. I think so. He keeps posting his S thirteen, like photos of his S thirteen locally. So I just get so confused. Yeah. Yeah, because I think I see him on Instagram quite a bit. So, yeah. Maybe, anyway. maybe he's somebody we need on in the future. Uh, yeah, he should. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a good idea. I, I've never actually met him, but I think I've been to the same areas as him. Um, yeah, so. we did um, a drift school. He came out to a drift school uh, a while back, and so it was basically me, Brooke, and Andrew all driving together and it was okay. good like it was instant instant consistent driving which was great considering I'd never driven with him before and could you know predict him straight off the bat yeah no I was sort of more talking about some street lamp inspections overseas oh yeah 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 apparently he's he was commented there. and he's also commented that I don't have an S13 in Australia <laughs> Maybe that's someone else. I'm getting confused. <laughs> now he had the uh, S4, the blue S14 in Japan, and the FD. I think it was. He, he recently did an engine change in the FD or something. Or rebuild. Yeah. yeah. And that's not the same guy. Has an S13. Maybe I've got two. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you've just offended Thinking some of our, yeah. just offended our viewers. All right, fuck off, Shane. Uh, you're done, mate. We're cutting you off here. Clearly drunk. Should have should have quit <laughs> a half hour ago, guys. What are you yeah. doing? <laughs> and he said, I thought you loved me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Awkward. But, Andrew, if you we'd like to have you come on, at, on the show at some stage, so... Uh, Edge is building a schedule, so we'll try and schedule you on because it'd just be cool to to get some of your experiences from living and driving in Japan. Cool. All right. Um, All right. That's it. So, yeah, hopefully I'm going to try and secure a guest for next week, uh, but I haven't secured it yet. So watch your space. Yeah, and then there's potentially a big announcement this week from... Luke for Cash Kings and DCA round three. If the guest comes to fruition, uh, watch that space for that. And then also hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, there might be some big announcements from the guys at uh, Drift at Battlest for the Drift bit. Um, so I know yeah, that they've we'll, had some... We'll try and get him back on as well before that. Yeah, well, as, as soon as their news is through, they will be on so okay. hopefully hopefully if all that goes well for them um everybody keep fingers crossed for them they're also heading over to seattle for fd in a couple of weeks so cool. fingers crossed for all their their stuff in the background all righty all right okay cool. good night guys thanks guys thanks uh shane for coming on as well thank you shane see you guys okay all right i'll just just give me a couple of moments to close this off don't awkwardly hang.